The Adventures of Tom Sawyer by Mark Twain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Aunt Polly, read by Elizabeth Clatt. Tom Sawyer, read by Eden Ray Hedrick. Cousin Sid, read by Tim Nelson. Alfred Temple, read by Elliot Gage. Jim, read by Kevin Davidson. Ben Rogers, read by Francis Brown. Cousin Mary, read by Ariel Lipshaw. Billy, read by Michaela. Mr. Walters, read by Lambda. Joe Harper, read by Monica M. C. Judge Thatcher, read by Jeff Machado. Mrs. Thatcher, read by Libby Gone. Reverend Sprague, read by Jeff Machado. Mrs. Harper, read by Ariel Lipshaw. Huckleberry Finn, read by Tricia G. Mr. Dobbins, read by Tavarish. Becky Thatcher, read by Amanda Friday. Dr. Robinson, read by Amanda Friday. Muff Potter. Read by Todd Jenkin. Injun Joe. Read by Alex Lella. The Sheriff. Read by Amanda Friday. Mary Austin. Read by Bethany Baldwin. Grace Miller. Read by Michaela. Sally Rogers. Played by Victoria. Susie Harper. Read by Victoria. Little Boy. Read by Michaela. Little Girl. Read by Ellie Cat. First Young Lady Read by Eden Ray Hedrick Second Young Lady Read by Sarah and Gracia Parshall Third Young Lady Read by Ellie Cat The Prosecutor Read by Maria Therese Muff Potter's Lawyer Read by Beth Thomas Injun Joe's Comrade Read by Christine G. Mr. Jones Read by Jeff Machado The Widow Douglas Read by Abigail Rasmussen Narrated by Bob Neufeld. The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. Preface. Most of the adventures recorded in this book really occurred. One or two were experiences of my own. The rest, those of boys who were schoolmates of mine. Huck Finn is drawn from life. Tom Sawyer also, but not from an individual. He is a combination of the characteristics of three boys whom I knew and therefore belongs to the composite order of architecture. The odd superstitions touched upon were all prevalent among children and slaves in the West at the period of this story, that is to say, thirty or forty years ago. Although my book is intended mainly for the entertainment of boys and girls, I hope it will not be shunned by men and women on that account, for part of my plan has been to try to pleasantly remind adults of what they once were themselves, and of how they felt and thought and talked, and what queer enterprises they sometimes engaged in. The Author Hartford, 1876 End of Preface Chapter One of The Adventures of Tom Sawyer by Mark Twain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter One You, Tom, Aunt Polly decides upon her duty, Tom practices music, the challenge, a private entrance. Tom? No answer. Tom! No answer. What's gone with that boy, I wonder? You, Tom! No answer. The old lady pulled her spectacles down and looked over them about the room. Then she put them up and looked out under them. She seldom or never looked through them for so small a thing as a boy. They were her state pair, the pride of her heart and were built for style, not service. She could have seen through a pair of stove-lids just as well. She looked perplexed for a moment, and then said, 
not fiercely, but still loud enough for the furniture to hear. Well, I lay if I get hold of you all. She did not finish, for by this time she was bending down and punching under the bed with the broom, and so she needed breath to punctuate the punches with. She resurrected nothing but the cat. I never did see the beat of that boy. She went to the open door and stood in it and looked out among the tomato vines and jimps and weeds that constituted the garden. No Tom. So she lifted up her voice at an angle calculated for distance and shouted, You, Tom! There was a slight noise behind her, and she turned just in time to seize a small boy by the slack of his roundabout and arrest his flight. There! I might have thought of that closet. What you been doing in there? Nothing. Nothing? Look at your hands, and look at your mouth. What is that truck? I don't know, Aunt. Well, I know. It's jam, that's what it is. Forty times I've said if you didn't let that jam alone, I'd skin you. Hand me that switch. The switch hovered in the air. The peril was desperate. My! Look behind you, Aunt. The old lady whirled round and, and snatched her skirts out of danger. The lad fled on the instant, scrambled up the high board fence, and disappeared over it. His Aunt Polly stood surprised a moment, and then broke into a gentle laugh. <laughs> Hang the boy! Can't I never learn anything? Ain't he played me tricks enough like that for me to be looking out for him by this time? But old fools is the biggest fools there is. Can't learn an old dog new tricks, as the saying is. But my goodness, he never plays them alike two days, and how is a body to know what's coming? He appears to know just how long he can torment me before I get my dander up. And he knows if he can make me out to puff me off for a minute or make me laugh, it's all down again and I can't hit him a lick. I ain't doing my duty by that boy, and that's the Lord's truth, goodness knows. Spare the rod and spoil the child, as the good book says. I'm a layin' up sin and sufferin' for us both, I know. He's full of the old scratch, but laws o' me! He's my own dead sister's boy, poor thing, and I ain't got the heart to lash him somehow. Every time I let him off my conscience does hurt me so, and every time I hit him my old heart most breaks. Well, oh well, man that is born of woman is of a few days and full of trouble, as the scripture says, and I reckon it's so. He'll play hooky this evening and I'll just be obliged to make him work to-morrow to punish him. It's mighty hard to make him work Saturdays when all the boys is having holiday, but he hates work more than he hates anything else, and I've got to do some of my duty by him, or I'll be the ruination of the child." Tom did play hooky, and he had a very good time. He got back home barely in season to help Jim, the small colored boy, saw next day's wood and split the kindlings before supper. At least he was there in time to tell his adventures to Jim while Jim did three-fourths of the work. Tom's younger brother, or rather half-brother, Sid, was already through with his part of the work, picking up chips, for he was a quiet boy and had no adventurous, troublesome ways. While Tom was eating his supper, and stealing sugar as opportunity offered, Aunt Polly asked him questions that were full of guile and very deep for she wanted to trap him into damaging revealments. Like many other simple-hearted souls, it was her pet vanity to believe she was endowed with a talent for dark and mysterious diplomacy, and she loved to contemplate her most transparent devices as marvels of low cunning. Said she, Tom, it was middle and warm in school, weren't it? Yes, sir. Powerful warm, weren't it? Yes, sir. Didn't you want to go in a swimming, Tom? A bit of a scare shot through Tom, a touch of uncomfortable suspicion. He searched Aunt Polly's face, but it told him nothing. So he said, No, um, well, not very much. The old lady reached out her hand and felt Tom's shirt, and said, But you ain't too warm now, though and it flattered her to reflect that she had discovered that the shirt was dry without anybody knowing that that was what she had in her mind. But in spite of her, Tom knew where the wind lay now, so he forestalled what might be the next move. 
some of us pumped on our heads mine's damp yet see aunt polly was vexed to think she had overlooked that bit of circumstantial evidence and missed a trick then she had a new inspiration tom you didn't have to undo your shirt collar where i sewed it to pump on your head did you unbutton your jacket the trouble vanished out of tom's face he opened his jacket his shirt collar was securely sewed bother well go along with you i'd made sure you'd played hooky and been a swimmin but i forgive you tom i reckon you're a kind of a singed cat as the saying is better and you look this time she was half sorry her sagacity had miscarried and half glad that tom had stumbled into obedient conduct for once but sydney said well now if i didn't think you sewed his collar with white thread but it's black why i did sew it with white tom but tom did not wait for the rest as he went out at the door he said sitty i'll lick you for that in a safe place tom examined two large needles which were thrust into the lapels of his jacket and had thread bound about them one needle carried white thread and the other black he said she'd never noticed if it hadn't been for sid confound it sometimes he sews it with white and sometimes he sews it with black i wish to jiminy she'd stick to one or t'other i can't keep the run of em but i bet you i'll lamb sit for that i'll learn him he was not the model boy of the village he knew the model boy very well though and he loathed him within two minutes or even less he had forgotten all his troubles not because his troubles were one whit less heavy and bitter to him than a man's are to a man but because a new and powerful interest bore them down and drove them out of his mind for the time just as men's misfortunes are forgotten in the excitement of new enterprises this new interest was a valued novelty in whistling which he had just acquired from a negro and he was suffering to practice it undisturbed it consisted in a peculiar bird-like turn a sort of liquid warble produced by touching the tongue to the roof of the mouth at short intervals in the midst of the music the reader probably remembers how to do it if he has ever been a boy diligence and attention soon gave him the knack of it and he strode down the street with his mouth full of harmony and his soul full of gratitude he felt much as an astronomer feels who has discovered a new planet no doubt as far as strong deep unalloyed pleasure is concerned the advantage was with the boy not the astronomer the summer evenings were long it was not dark yet presently tom checked his whistle a stranger was before him a boy a shade larger than himself a newcomer of any age or either sex was an impressive curiosity in the poor little shabby village of st petersburg this boy was well dressed too well dressed on a weekday this was simply astounding his cap was a dainty thing his close-buttoned blue cloth roundabout was new and natty and so were the pantaloons he had shoes on and it was only friday he even wore a necktie a bright bit of ribbon he had a cityfied air about him that ate into tom's vitals the more tom stared at the splendid marvel the higher he turned up his nose at his finery and the shabbier and shabbier his own outfit seemed to him to grow neither boy spoke if one moved the other moved but only sideways in a circle they kept face to face and eye to eye all the time finally tom said i can lick you i'd like to see you try it well i can do it no you can't either yes i can no you can't i can you can't can can't an uncomfortable pause then tom said what's your name tisn't any of your business maybe well i allow i'll make it my business well why don't you if you say much i will much 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 there now oh you think you're mighty smart don't you i could lick you with one hand tied behind me if i wanted to well why don't you do it you say you can do it well i will if you fool with me 
Oh, yes, I've seen whole families in the same fix. Smarty, you think you're some now, don't you? Oh, what a hat. You can lump that hat if you don't like it. I dare you to knock it off. And anybody that'll take a dare will suck eggs. You're a liar. You're another. You're a fighting liar and doesn't take it up. Ah, uh, take a walk. Say, if you give me much more of your sass, I'll take and bounce a rock off in your head. Oh, of course you will. Well, I will. Well, why don't you do it then? What do you keep saying you will for? Why don't you do it? It's because you're afraid. I ain't afraid. You are. I ain't. You are. Another pause, and more eyeing and sidling around each other. Presently they were shoulder to shoulder. Tom said, Get away from here. Go away yourself. I won't. I won't either. So they stood, each with a foot placed at an angle as a brace, and both shoving with might and main, and glowering at each other with hate. But neither could get an advantage. After struggling till both were hot and flushed, each relaxed his strain with watchful caution, and Tom said, "'You're a coward and a pup. I'll tell my big brother on you, and he can thrash you with his little finger, and I'll make him do it, too.' "'What do I care for you, big brother? I've got a brother that's bigger than he is, and what's more, he can throw him over a fence, too.' Both brothers were imaginary. "'That's a lie.' You're saying so, don't make it so. Tom drew a line in the dust with his big toe, and said, I dare you to step over that, and I'll lick you till you can't stand up. Anybody that'll take a dare will steal sheep. The new boy stepped over promptly, and said, Now you said you'd do it, now let's see you do it. Don't you crowd me now, you better look out. Well, you said you'd do it, why don't you do it? By jingo, for two cents I will do it. The new boy took two broad coppers out of his pocket and held them out with derision. Tom struck them to the ground. In an instant, both boys were rolling and tumbling in the dirt, gripped together like cats, and for the space of a minute they tugged and tore at each other's hair and clothes, punched and scratched each other's nose, and covered themselves with dust and glory. Presently the confusion took form and through the fog of battle tom appeared seated astride the new boy and pounding him with his fists how enough said he the boy only struggled to free himself he was crying mainly from rage how enough and the pounding went on at last the stranger got out a smothered enough and tom let him up and said now that'll learn you Better look out who you're fooling with next time. The new boy went off brushing the dust from his clothes, sobbing, snuffling, and occasionally looking back and shaking his head, and threatening what he would do to Tom the next time he caught him out. To which Tom responded with jeers, and started off in high feather, and as soon as his back was turned, the new boy snatched up a stone, threw it, and hit him between the shoulders and then turned tail and ran like an antelope. Tom chased the traitor home, and thus found out where he lived. He then held a position at the gate for some time, daring the enemy to come outside. But the enemy only made faces at him through the window, and declined. At last the enemy's mother appeared, and called Tom a bad, vicious, vulgar child, and ordered him away. So he went away, but he said he allowed to lay for that boy. He got home pretty late that night, and when he climbed cautiously in at the window, he uncovered an ambuscade in the person of his aunt. And when she saw the state his clothes were in, her resolution to turn his Saturday holiday into captivity at hard labor became adamantine in its firmness. End of chapter 1 Chapter Two of The Adventures of Tom Sawyer by Mark Twain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Chapter Two: Strong Temptations, Strategic Movements, The Innocents Beguiled. Saturday morning was come, and all the summer world was bright and fresh and brimming with life. There was a song in every heart, and if the heart was young, the music issued at the lips. There was cheer in every face, and a spring in every step. The locust trees were in bloom, and the fragrance of the blossoms filled the air. Cardiff Hill, beyond the village and above it, was green with vegetation, and it lay just far enough away to seem a delectable land, dreamy, reposeful, and inviting. Tom appeared on the sidewalk with a bucket of whitewash and a long-handled brush. He surveyed the fence, but all gladness left him, and a deep melancholy settled down upon his spirit. Thirty yards of board fence nine feet high. Life to him seemed hollow, and existence but a burden. Sighing, he dipped his brush and passed it along the topmost plank, repeated the operation, did it again, compared the insignificant whitewashed streak with the far-reaching continent of unwhitewashed fence, and sat down on a tree-box, discouraged. Jim came skipping out at the gate with a tin pail and singing buffalo gals. Bringing water from the town pump had always been hateful work in Tom's eyes before, but now it did not strike him so. He remembered that there was company at the pump. White, mulatto, and negro boys and girls were always there, waiting their turns, resting, trading playthings, quarreling, fighting, skylarking, and he remembered that although the pump was only a hundred and fifty yards off, Jim never got back with a bucket of water under an hour, and even then somebody generally had to go after him. Tom said, Say, Jim, I'll fetch the water if you whitewash some. Jim shook his head and said, Kate, Mars Tom. Oh, missus, she told me I got to go and get this water and not stop fooling around with anybody. She says she spec Mars Tom gwine to ask me to whitewashing, so she told me to go along to my own business. She lied she tended to whitewashing. Oh, never you mind what she said, Jim. That's the way she always talks. Give me the bucket. I won't be gone only a minute. She won't ever know. Oh, I doesn't, Mars Tom. Old missus, she taken tar the head off of me. Did she would. She, she never licks anybody, whacks them over the head with her thimble, and who cares for that, I'd like to know. She talks awful, but talk don't hurt. Anyways, it don't if she don't cry. Jim, I'll give you a marble. I'll give you a white alley. Jim began to waver. White alley, Jim, and it's a bully tall. My, that's a mighty gay marble, I tell you, but Mars Tom, I was powerful afraid of old Mrs. And besides, if you will, I'll show you my sore toe. Jim was only human. This attraction was too much for him. He put down his pail, took the white alley, and bent over the toe with absorbing interest while the bandage was being unwound. In another moment he was flying down the street with his pail in a tingling rear. Tom was whitewashing with vigor, and Aunt Polly was retiring from the field with a slipper in her hand and triumph in her eye. But Tom's energy did not last. He began to think of the fun he had planned for this day, and his sorrows multiplied. Soon the free boys would come tripping along on all sorts of delicious expeditions, and they would make a world of fun of him for having to work. The very thought of it burnt him like fire. He got out his worldly wealth and examined it. Bits of toys, marbles, and trash. Enough to buy an exchange of work, maybe, but not half enough to buy so much as half an hour of pure freedom. So he returned his straightened means to his pocket, and gave up the idea of trying to buy the boys. At this dark and hopeless moment an inspiration burst upon him, nothing less than a great magnificent inspiration. He took up his brush and went tranquilly to work. Ben Rogers hove in sight presently, the very boy of all boys whose ridicule he had been dreading. Ben's gait was the hop, skip, and jump, proof enough that his heart was light and his anticipations high. He was eating an apple, and giving a long, melodious whoop at intervals, followed by a deep-toned ding-dong-dong, ding-dong-dong. 
for he was personating a steamboat. As he drew near, he slackened speed, took the middle of the street, leaned far over to starboard, and rounded to, ponderously and with laborious pomp and circumstance, for he was personating the big Missouri, and considered himself to be drawing nine feet of water. He was boat and captain and engine bells combined, so he had to imagine himself standing on his own hurricane deck, giving the orders and executing them. Stopper, sir, tingling ling. The headway ran almost out, and he drew up slowly toward the sidewalk. Ship up to bed, tingling ling. His arms straightened and stiffened down his sides. Set her back on stabber, tingling ling. Chow, ch chow wow, chow. His right hand, meantime, describing stately circles, for it was representing a forty foot wheel. Let her go back on stabber, tingling ling. Cha chow. The left hand began to describe circles. Stop the stabber, tingling ling, stop the labbard, come head on the stabber, stop her, let your outside turn over slow, tingling ling, chow wow wow, get out that headline, lively now, come out with your spring line, what are you about there? Take a turn round the stump with the bite of it, stand by that stage now, let her go, done with the engine, sir, tingling ling. Shh, shh, shh. Trying the gauge cocks. Tom went on whitewashing, paid no attention to the steamboat. Ben stared a moment, and then said, Hi, hi, you're a stump, ain't you? No answer. Tom surveyed his last touch with an eye of an artist. Then he gave his brush another gentle sweep and surveyed the result as before. Ben ranged up alongside of him. Tom's mouth watered for the apple, but he stuck to his work. Ben said, mm, Hello, old chap. You got to work, hey? Tom wheeled suddenly, and said, "'Why, it's you, Ben. I weren't noticing.' "'Say, I'm going in a-swimming, I am. Don't you wish you could? But of course you'd rather work, wouldn't you? Of course you would.' Tom contemplated the boy a bit, and said, "'What do you call work?' "'Why, ain't that work?' Tom resumed his whitewashing, and answered carelessly, "'Well, maybe it is, and maybe it ain't. All I know is it suits Tom Sawyer. Oh, come now. You don't mean to let on that you like it. The brush continued to move. Like it? Well, I don't see why I oughtn't to like it. Does a boy get a chance to whitewash a fence every day? That put the thing in a new light. Ben stopped nibbling his apple. Tom swept his brush daintily back and forth, stepped back to note the effect, added a touch here and there, criticized the effect again. Ben, watching every move and getting more and more interested, more and more absorbed, presently he said, Say, Tom, let me whitewash a little. Tom considered, was about to consent, but he altered his mind. No, no, I reckon it wouldn't hardly do, Ben. You see, Aunt Polly's awful particular about this fence, right here on the street, you know. But if it was the back fence, I wouldn't mind, and she wouldn't. Yes, yeah, she's awful particular about this fence. It's got to be done very careful. I reckon there ain't one boy in a thousand, maybe two thousand, that can do it the way it's got to be done. No, is that so? Oh, come on now, let me just try. Only just a little. i let you if you was me, Tom. Then I'd like to, honest Injun. But Aunt Polly, well, Jim wanted to do it, but she wouldn't let him. Sid wanted to do it, and she wouldn't let Sid. Now don't you see how I'm fixed? If you was to tackle this fence and anything was to happen to it. Oh, shucks, I'll be just as careful. Now, let me try. Say, I'll give you the car and my apple. Well, here, no, Ben, now don't, I'm afeard. I'll give you all of it. Tom gave up the brush, with reluctance in his face, but alacrity in his heart. And while the late steamer, Big Missouri, worked and sweated in the sun, the retired artist sat on a barrel in the shade close by, dangled his legs, munched his apple, and planned the slaughter of more innocents. There was no lack of material. Boys happened along every little while. They came to jeer, but remained to whitewash. By the time Ben was fagged out, Tom had traded the next chance to Billy Fisher for a kite in good repair and when he played out, Johnny Miller bought in for a dead rat and a string to swing it with, 
and so on and so on, hour after hour, and when the middle of the afternoon came, from being a poor, poverty-stricken boy in the morning, Tom was literally rolling in wealth. He had, besides the things before mentioned, twelve marbles, part of a Jew's harp, a piece of blue bottle-glass to look through, a spool cannon, a key that wouldn't unlock anything, a fragment of chalk, a glass stopper of a decanter, a tin soldier, a couple of tadpoles, six firecrackers, a kitten with only one eye, a brass doorknob, a dog collar, but no dog, the handle of a knife, four pieces of orange peel, and a dilapidated old window sash. He had had a nice good idle time all the while, plenty of company, and the fence had three coats of whitewash on it and if he hadn't run out of whitewash he would have bankrupted every boy in the village tom said to himself that it was not such a hollow world after all he had discovered a great law of human action without knowing it namely that in order to make a man or a boy covet a thing it is only necessary to make the thing difficult to attain if he had been a great and wise philosopher like the writer of this book he would now have comprehended that work consists of whatever a body is obliged to do, and that play consisted of whatever a body is not obliged to do. And this would help him to understand why constructing artificial flowers, or performing on a treadmill is work, while rolling ten pins or climbing Mont Blanc is only amusement. There are wealthy gentlemen in England who drive four-horse passenger coaches twenty or thirty miles on a daily line in the summer, because the privilege costs them considerable money, but if they were offered wages for the service, that would turn it into work, and then they would resign. The boy mused a while over the substantial change which had taken place in his worldly circumstances, and then wended toward headquarters to report. End of chapter 2《Chapter Three of the Adventures of Tom Sawyer by Mark Twain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Three: Tom as a General, Triumph and Reward, Dismal Felicity, Commission and Omission. Tom presented himself before Aunt Polly who was sitting by an open window in a pleasant rearward apartment, which was bedroom, breakfast-room, dining-room, and library combined. The balmy summer air, the restful quiet, the odor of the flowers, and the drowsing murmur of the bees had had their effect, and she was nodding over her knitting, for she had no company but the cat, and it was asleep in her lap. Her spectacles were propped up on her gray head for safety. She had thought that, of course, Tom had deserted long ago, and she wondered at seeing him place himself in her power again in this intrepid way. He said, Mayn't I go and play now, Aunt? What? Already? How much have you done? It's all done, Aunt. Tom, don't lie to me. I can't bear it. I ain't, Aunt. It is all done. Aunt Polly placed small trust in such evidence. She went out to see for herself and she would have been content to find twenty per cent of Tom's statement true. When she found the entire fence whitewashed, and not only whitewashed, but elaborately coated and recoated, and even a streak added to the ground, her astonishment was almost unspeakable. She said, Well, I never. There's no getting round it. You can work when you're a mind to, Tom. And then she diluted the compliment by adding, but it's powerful seldom you're a mind to, I'm bound to say. Well, go long and play. But mind you get back some time in a week, or I'll tan you. She was so overcome by the splendor of his achievement that she took him into the closet and selected a choice apple and delivered it to him, along with an improving lecture upon the added value and flavor a treat took to itself when it came without sin through virtuous effort. And while she closed with a happy scriptural flourish, he hooked a doughnut. Then he skipped out, and saw Sid just starting up the outside stairway that led to the back rooms on the second floor. Clods were handy, 
and the air was full of them in a twinkling. They raged around Sid like a hailstorm, and before Aunt Polly could collect her surprised faculties and sally to the rescue, six or seven clods had taken personal effect, and Tom was over the fence and gone. There was a gate, but as a general thing he was too crowded for time to make use of it. His soul was at peace, now that he had settled with Sid for calling attention to his black thread and getting him into trouble. Tom skirted the block and came round into a muddy alley that led by the back of his aunt's cow-stable. He presently got safely beyond the reach of capture and punishment, and hastened toward the public square of the village, where two military companies of boys had met for conflict, according to previous appointment. Tom was general of one of these armies, Joe Harper, a bosom friend, general of the other. These two great commanders did not condescend to fight in person, that being better suited to the still smaller fry, but sat together on an eminence and conducted the field's operations by orders delivered through aides de camp. Tom's army won a great victory after a long and hard-fought battle. Then the dead were counted, prisoners exchanged, the terms of the next disagreement agreed upon, and the day for the necessary battle appointed, after which the armies fell into line and marched away, and Tom turned homeward alone. As he was passing by the house where Jeff Thatcher lived, he saw a new girl in the garden, a lovely little blue-eyed creature with yellow hair plaited into two long tails, white summer frock, and embroidered pantalettes. The fresh-crowned hero fell without firing a shot. A certain Amy Lawrence vanished out of his heart and left not even a memory of herself behind. He had thought he loved her to distraction. He had regarded his passion as adoration, and behold, it was only a pure little evanescent partiality. He had been months winning her. She had confessed hardly a week ago. He had been the happiest and the proudest boy in the world only seven short days, and here, in an instant of time, she had gone out of his heart like a casual stranger whose visit is done. He worshipped this new angel with a furtive eye till he saw that she had discovered him. Then he pretended he did not know she was present, and began to show off in all sorts of absurd boyish ways in order to win her admiration. He kept up this grotesque foolishness for some time, but by and by, while he was in the midst of some dangerous gymnastic performances, he glanced aside and saw that the little girl was wending her way toward the house. Tom came up to the fence and leaned on it, grieving and hoping she would tarry yet a while longer. She halted a moment on the steps and then moved toward the door. Tom heaved a great sigh as she put her foot on the threshold but his face lit up right away, for she tossed a pansy over the fence a moment before she disappeared. The boy ran around and stopped within a foot or two of the flower, and then shaded his eyes with his hand and began to look down street, as if he had discovered something of interest going on in that direction. Presently he picked up a straw and began to balance it on his nose, with his head tilted far back. As he moved from side to side in his efforts, he edged nearer and nearer toward the pansy. Finally his bare foot rested upon it, his pliant toes closed upon it, and he hopped away with the treasure and disappeared round the corner. But only for a minute, only while he could button the flower inside his jacket, next his heart, or next his stomach, possibly for he was not much posted in anatomy, and not hypocritical anyway. He returned now and hung about the fence till nightfall, showing off as before. But the girl never exhibited herself again, though Tom comforted himself a little with the hope that she had been near some window meantime and been aware of his intentions. Finally he strode home reluctantly, with his poor head full of visions. All through supper his spirits were so high that his aunt wondered what had got into the child. He took a good scolding about clodding Sid and did not seem to mind it in the least. He tried to steal sugar under his aunt's very nose and got his knuckles wrapped for it. He said, Aunt, you don't whack Sid when he takes it. Well, Sid don't torment a body the way you do. 
You'd be always into that sugar if I weren't watching you. Presently she stepped into the kitchen, and Sid, happy in his immunity, reached for the sugar bowl, a sort of glorying over Tom which was well-nigh unbearable. But Sid's fingers slipped, and the bowl dropped and broke. Tom was in ecstasies, in such ecstasies that he even controlled his tongue and was silent. He said to himself that he would not speak a word, even when his aunt came in, but would sit perfectly still till she asked who had done the mischief, and then he would tell, and there would be nothing so good in the world as to see that pet model catch it. He was so brimful of exultation that he could hardly hold himself when the old lady came back and stood above the wreck, discharging lightnings of wrath from over her spectacles. He said to himself, now it's coming and the next instant he was sprawling on the floor the potent palm was uplifted to strike again when tom cried out hold on now what are you melting me for sid broke it aunt polly paused perplexed and tom looked for healing pity but when she got her tongue again she only said mm. well you didn't get a lick amiss i reckon you been into some other audacious mischief when i weren't around like enough then her conscience reproached her, and she yearned to say something kind and loving, but she judged that this would be construed into a confession that she had been in the wrong, and discipline forbade that. So she kept silence, and went about her affairs with a troubled heart. Tom sulked in a corner and exalted his woes. He knew that in her heart his aunt was on her knees to him, and he was morosely gratified by the consciousness of it he would hang out no signals he would take notice of none he knew that a yearning glance fell upon him now and then through a film of tears but he refused recognition of it he pictured himself lying sick unto death and his aunt bending over him beseeching one little forgiving word but he would turn his face to the wall and die with that word unsaid ah how would she feel then and he pictured himself brought home from the river, dead, with his curls all wet and his sore heart at rest. How she would throw herself upon him, and how her tears would fall like rain, and her lips pray God to give her back her boy, and she would never, never abuse him any more. But he would lie there, cold and white, and make no sign, a poor little sufferer whose griefs were at an end. He so worked upon his feelings with the pathos of these dreams that he had to keep swallowing. He was so like to choke, and his eyes swam in a blur of water, which overflowed when he winked and ran down and trickled from the end of his nose. And such a luxury to him was this petting of his sorrows that he could not bear to have any worldly cheeriness or any grating delight intrude upon it. It was too sacred for such contact, and so, presently, when his cousin Mary danced in, all alive with the joy of seeing home again after an age-long visit of one week to the country, he got up and moved in clouds and darkness out one door as she brought song and sunshine in at the other. He wandered far from the accustomed haunts of boys and sought desolate places that were in harmony with his spirit. A log raft in the river invited him, and he seated himself on its outer edge and contemplated the dreary vastness of the stream, wishing the while that he could only be drowned, all at once and unconsciously, without undergoing the uncomfortable routine devised by nature. Then he thought of his flower. He got it out, rumpled and wilted, and it mightily increased his dismal felicity. He wondered if she would pity him if she knew. Would she cry? and wished that she had a right to put her arms around his neck and comfort him. Or would she turn coldly away, like all the hollow world? This picture brought such an agony of pleasurable suffering that he worked it over and over again in his mind, and set it up in new and very lights, till he wore it threadbare. At last he rose up sighing, and departed in the darkness. About half-past nine or ten o'clock, he came along the deserted street to where the adored unknown lived. He paused a moment. No sound fell upon his listening ear. A candle was casting a dull glow upon the curtain of a second-story window. 
was the sacred presence there he climbed the fence threaded his stealthy way through the plants till he stood under that window he looked up at it long and with emotion then he lay down on the ground under it disposing himself upon his back with his hands clasped upon his breast and holding his poor wilted flower and thus he would die out in the cold world with no shelter over his homeless head no friendly hand to wipe the death damps from his brow no loving face to bend pityingly over him when the great agony came and thus she would see him when she looked out upon the glad morning and oh would she drop one little tear upon his poor lifeless form would she heave one little sigh to see a bright young life so rudely blighted so untimely cut down the window went up a maid-servant's discordant voice profaned the holy calm and a deluge of water drenched the prone martyr's remains the strangling hero sprang up with a relieving snort there was a whiz as of a missile in the air mingled with the murmur of a curse a sound as of shivering glass followed and a small vague form went over the fence and shot away in the gloom not long after as tom all undressed for bed was surveying his drenched garments by the light of a tallow dip sid woke up but if he had any dim idea of making any references to allusions he thought better of it and held his peace for there was danger in tom's eye tom turned in without the added vexation of prayers and sid made mental note of the omission End of chapter three Chapter Four of the Adventures of Tom Sawyer by Mark Twain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Four Mental Acrobatics Attending Sunday School The Superintendent Showing Off Tom Lionized. The sun rose upon a tranquil world and beamed down upon the peaceful village like a benediction. Breakfast over, Aunt Polly had family worship. It began with a prayer built from the ground up of solid courses of scriptural quotations, welded together with a thin mortar of originality, and from the summit of this she delivered a grim chapter of the Mosaic Law, as from Sinai then tom girded up his loins so to speak and went to work to get his verses sid had learned his lesson days before tom bent all his energies to the memorizing of five verses and he chose part of the sermon on the mount because he could find no verses that were shorter at the end of half an hour tom had a vague general idea of his lesson but no more for his mind was traversing the whole field of human thought, and his hands were busy with distracting recreations. Mary took his book to hear him recite, and he tried to find his way through the fog. Blessed are the... uh... uh... Poor? Yes, poor. Blessed are the poor... uh... uh... In spirit in spirit blessed are the poor in spirit for they they theirs for theirs blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven blessed are they that mourn for they they sh for they uh s h a for they s h oh i don't know what it is shall oh shall for they shall for they shall uh, uh shall mourn uh uh blessed are they that shall they that uh they that shall mourn for they shall uh shall what why don't you tell me mary what do you want to be so mean for 
Oh, Tom, you poor thick-headed thing. I'm not teasing you. I wouldn't do that. You must go and learn it again. Don't you be discouraged, Tom. You'll manage it. And if you do, I'll give you something ever so nice. There now, that's a good boy. All right. What is it, Mary? Tell me what it is. Never you mind, Tom. You know if I say it's nice, it is nice. You bet that's so, Mary. All right, I'll tackle it again. And he did tackle it again, and under the double pressure of curiosity and prospective gain, he did it with such spirit that he accomplished a shining success. Mary gave him a brand new Barlow knife worth twelve and a half cents, and the convulsion of delight that swept his system shook him to his foundations. True, the knife would not cut anything, but it was a sure enough Barlow, and there was inconceivable grandeur in that though where the western boys ever got the idea that such a weapon could possibly be counterfeited to its injury is an imposing mystery and will always remain so perhaps tom contrived to scarify the cupboard with it and was arranging to begin on the bureau when he was called off to dress for sunday school mary gave him a tin basin of water and a piece of soap and he went outside the door and set the basin on a little bench there then he dipped the soap in the water and laid it down, turned up his sleeves, poured out the water on the ground gently, and then entered the kitchen and began to wipe his face diligently on the towel behind the door. But Mary removed the towel and said, Now, ain't you ashamed, Tom? You mustn't be so bad. Water won't hurt you. Tom was a trifle disconcerted. The basin was refilled and this time he stood over it a little while gathering resolution took in a big breath and began when he entered the kitchen presently with both eyes shut and groping for the towel with his hands an honourable testimony of suds and water was dripping from his face but when he emerged from the towel he was not yet satisfactory for the clean territory stopped short at his chin and his jaws like a mask below and beyond this line there was a dark expanse of unirrigated soil that spread downward in front and backward around his neck mary took him in hand and when she was done with him he was a man and a brother without distinction of colour and his saturated hair was neatly brushed and his short curls wrought into a dainty and symmetrical general effect he privately smoothed out the curls with labour and difficulty and plastered his hair close down to his head for he held curls to be effeminate and his own filled his life with bitterness then mary got out a suit of his clothing that had been used only on sundays during two years they were simply called his other clothes and so by that we know the size of his wardrobe the girl put him to rights after he had dressed himself she buttoned his neat roundabout up to his chin turned his vast shirt collar down over his shoulders brushed him off and crowned him with his speckled straw hat he now looked exceedingly improved and uncomfortable he was fully as uncomfortable as he looked for there was a restraint about whole clothes and cleanliness that galled him he hoped that mary would forget his shoes but the hope was blighted she coated them thoroughly with tallow as was the custom and brought them out he lost his temper and said he was always made to do everything he didn't want to do but mary said persuasively please tom that's a good boy so he got into the shoes snarling mary was soon ready and the three children set out for sunday school a place that tom hated with his whole heart but Sid and Mary were fond of it. Sabbath school hours were from nine to half past ten, and then church service. Two of the children always remained for the sermon voluntarily, and the other always remained too, for stronger reasons. The church's high backed, uncushioned pews would seat about three hundred persons. The edifice was but a small, plain affair, with a sort of pine board tree box on top of it for a steeple. At the door, Tom dropped back a step and accosted a Sunday-dressed comrade. Say, Billy, got a yellow ticket? Yes. What'll you take for her? What'll you give? Piece of licorice and a fish hook. Let's see em. 
Tom exhibited. They were satisfactory, and the property changed hands. Then Tom traded a couple of white alleys for three red tickets, and some small trifle or other for a couple of blue ones. He waylaid other boys as they came, and went on buying tickets of various colors ten or fifteen minutes longer. He entered the church now with a swarm of clean and noisy boys and girls, proceeded to his seat, and started a quarrel with the first boy that came handy. The teacher, a grave elderly man, interfered, then turned his back a moment, and Tom pulled a boy's hair in the next bench, and was absorbed in his book when the boy turned around, stuck a pin in another boy presently in order to hear him say, Ouch! and got a new reprimand from his teacher. Tom's whole class were of a pattern, restless, noisy, and troublesome. When they came to recite their lessons, not one of them knew his verses perfectly, but had to be prompted all along. However, they worried through, and each got his reward, in small blue tickets, each with a passage of scripture on it. Each blue ticket was pay for two verses of the recitation. Ten blue tickets equaled a red one, and could be exchanged for it. Ten red tickets equaled a yellow one. For ten yellow tickets the superintendent gave a very plainly bound Bible, worth forty cents in those easy times, to the pupil. How many of my readers would have the industry and application to memorize two thousand verses, even from a Doré Bible? And yet Mary had acquired two Bibles in this way. It was the patient work of two years, and a boy of German parentage had won four or five. He once recited three thousand verses without stopping, but the strain upon his mental faculties was too great, and he was little better than an idiot from that day forth. A grievous misfortune for the school, for on great occasions, before company, the superintendent, as Tom expressed it, had always made this boy come out and spread himself. Only the older pupils managed to keep their tickets and stick to their tedious work long enough to get a Bible and so the delivery of one of these prizes was a rare and noteworthy circumstance. The successful pupil was so great and conspicuous for that day that on the spot every scholar's heart was fired with a fresh ambition that often lasted a couple of weeks. It is possible that Tom's mental stomach had never really hungered for one of those prizes, but unquestionably his entire being had for many a day longed for the glory and the éclat that came with it. In due course the superintendent stood up in front of the pulpit, with a closed hymn-book in his hand and his forefinger inserted between his leaves, and commanded attention. When a Sunday school superintendent makes his customary little speech, a hymn-book in the hand is as necessary as the inevitable sheet of music in the hand of a singer who stands forward on the platform and sings a solo at a concert, the why is a mystery, for neither the hymn-book nor the sheet of music is ever referred to by the sufferer. This superintendent was a slim creature of thirty-five, with a sandy goatee and short sandy hair. He wore a stiff standing collar, whose upper edge almost reached his ears, and whose sharp points curved forward abreast the corners of his mouth, a fence that compelled a straight look out ahead and a turning of the whole body when a side view was required his chin was propped on a spreading cravat which was as broad and as long as a banknote and had fringed ends his boot toes were turned sharply up in the fashion of the day like sleigh runners an effect patiently and laboriously produced by the young men by sitting with their toes pressed against a wall for hours together Mr. Walters was very earnest of mien and very sincere and honest at heart, and he held sacred things and places in such reverence, and so separated them from worldly matters, that unconsciously to himself his Sunday school voice had acquired a peculiar intonation which was wholly absent on weekdays. He began after this fashion. Now, children, I want you all to sit up just as straight and pretty as you can and give me all your attention for a minute or two. There, that's it. That is the way good little boys and girls should do. I see one little girl who is looking out of the window. I am afraid she thinks I am out there somewhere. Perhaps up in one of the trees making a speech to the little birds. A plausive titter. 
i want to tell you how good it makes me feel to see so many bright clean little faces assembled in a place like this learning to do right and be good and so forth and so on it is not necessary to set down the rest of the oration it was of a pattern which does not vary and so it is familiar to us all the latter third of the speech was marred by the resumption of fights and other recreations among certain of the bad boys and by fidgetings and whisperings that extended far and wide washing even to the bases of isolated and incorruptible rocks like sid and mary but now every sound ceased suddenly with the subsidence of mr walter's voice and the conclusion of the speech was received with a burst of silent gratitude a good part of the whispering had been occasioned by an event which was more or less rare the entrance of visitors lawyer thatcher accompanied by a very feeble and aged man a fine portly middle-aged gentleman with iron-gray hair and a dignified lady who was doubtless the latter's wife the lady was leading a child tom had been restless and full of chafings and repinings conscience smitten too he could not meet amy lawrence's eye he could not brook her loving gaze but when he saw this small newcomer his soul was all ablaze with bliss in a moment the next moment he was showing off with all his might cuffing boys pulling hair making faces in a word using every art that seemed likely to fascinate a girl and win her applause his exaltation had but one alloy the memory of his humiliation in this angel's garden and the record in sand was fast washing out under the waves of happiness that were sweeping over it now the visitors were given the highest seat of honour and as soon as mr walter's speech was finished he introduced them to the school the middle-aged man turned out to be a prodigious personage no less a one than the county judge altogether the most august creation these children had ever looked upon and they wondered what kind of material he was made of and they half wanted to hear him roar and were half afraid he might too he was from constantinople twelve miles away so he had travelled and seen the world these very eyes that looked upon the county courthouse which was said to have a tin roof the awe which these reflections inspired was attested by the impressive silence and the ranks of staring eyes this was the great judge thatcher brother of their own lawyer jeff thatcher immediately went forward to be familiar with the great man and be envied by the school it would have been music to his soul to hear the whisperings look at him jim he's a-going up there say look he's a-going to shake hands with him he is shaking hands with him by jinx don't you wish you was jeff mr walters fell to showing off with all sorts of official bustlings and activities giving orders delivering judgments discharging directions here there everywhere that he could find a target the librarian showed off running hither and thither with his arms full of books and making a deal of the splutter and fuss that insect authority delights in the young lady teachers showed off bending sweetly over pupils that were lately being boxed lifting pretty warning fingers at bad little boys and patting good ones lovingly the young gentlemen teachers showed off with small scoldings and other little displays of authority and fine attention to discipline and most of the teachers of both sexes found business up at the library by the pulpit and it was business that frequently had to be done over again two or three times with much seeming vexation the little girls showed off in various ways and the little boys showed off with such diligence that the air was thick with paper wads and the murmur of scufflings and above it all the great man sat and beamed a majestic judicial smile upon all the house and warmed himself in the sum of his own grandeur for he was showing off too there was only one thing wanting to make mr walter's ecstasy complete and that was a chance to deliver a bible prize and exhibit a prodigy several pupils had a few yellow tickets but none had enough he had been around among the star pupils inquiring he would have given worlds now to have that german lad back again with a sound mind 
and now at this time when hope was dead tom sawyer came forward with nine yellow tickets nine red tickets and ten blue ones and demanded a bible this was a thunderbolt out of a clear sky walters was not expecting an application from this source for the next ten years but there was no getting around it here were the certified checks and they were good for their face tom was therefore elevated to a place with the judge and the other elect and the great news was announced from headquarters it was the most stunning surprise of the decade and so profound was the sensation that it lifted the new hero up to the judicial one's altitude and the school had two marvels to gaze upon in place of one the boys were all eaten up with envy but those that suffered the bitterest pangs were those who perceived too late that they themselves had contributed to this hated splendor by trading tickets to tom for the wealth he had amassed in selling whitewashing privileges these despised themselves as being dupes of a wily fraud a guileful snake in the grass the prize was delivered to tom with as much effusion as the superintendent could pump up under the circumstances but it lacked somewhat of the true gush for the poor fellow's instinct taught him that there was a mystery here that could not well bear the light perhaps it was simply preposterous that this boy had warehoused two thousand sheaves of scriptural wisdom on his premises a dozen would strain his capacity without a doubt amy lawrence was proud and glad and she tried to make tom see it in her face but he wouldn't look she wondered then she was just a grain troubled next a dim suspicion came and went came again she watched a furtive glance told her worlds and then her heart broke and she was jealous and angry and the tears came and she hated everybody tom most of all she thought tom was introduced to the judge but his tongue was tied his breath would hardly come his heart quaked partly because of the awful greatness of the man but mainly because he was her parent he would have liked to fall down and worship him if it were in the dark the judge put his hand on tom's head and called him a fine little man and asked him what his name was the boy stammered gasped and got it out tom oh no not tom it is thomas ah that's it i thought there was more to it maybe that's very well but you've another one i dare say and you'll tell it to me won't you tell the gentleman your other name thomas and say sir said walters you mustn't forget your manners thomas sawyer sir that's it that's a good boy fine boy fine manly little fellow two thousand verses is a great many very very great many and you can never be sorry for the trouble you took to learn them for knowledge is worth more than anything there is in the world it's what makes great men and good men you'll be a great man and a good man yourself some day thomas and then you'll look back and say it's all owing to the precious sunday school privileges of my boyhood it's all owing to my dear teachers that taught me to learn it's all owing to the good superintendent who encouraged me and watched over me and gave me a beautiful bible a splendid elegant bible to keep and have all for my own always it's all owing to right bringing up that is what you will say thomas and you wouldn't take any money for those two thousand verses <laughs> no indeed you wouldn't and now you wouldn't mind telling me and this lady some of the things you've learned no i know you wouldn't for we are proud of little boys that learn now no doubt you know the names of all the twelve disciples won't you tell us the names of the first two that were appointed tom was tugging at a buttonhole and looking sheepish he blushed now and his eyes fell mr walter's heart sank within him he said to himself it is not possible that the boy can answer the simplest question why did the judge ask him yet he felt obliged to speak up and say answer the gentleman thomas don't be afraid tom still hung fire now i know you'll tell me said the lady the names of the first two disciples were david and goliath let us draw the curtain of charity over the rest of the scene 
End of chapter 4Chapter Five of the Adventures of Tom Sawyer by Mark Twain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Five: A Useful Minister in Church, the Climax. About half past ten, the cracked bell of the small church began to ring and presently the people began to gather for the morning sermon the sunday school children distributed themselves about the house and occupied pews with their parents so as to be under supervision aunt polly came and tom and sid and mary sat with her tom being placed next the aisle in order that he might be as far away from the open window and the seductive outside summer scenes as possible the crowd filled up the aisles the aged and needy postmaster who had seen better days the mayor and his wife for they had a mayor there among other unnecessaries the justice of the peace the widow douglas fair smart and forty a generous good-hearted soul and well-to-do her hill mansion the only palace in the town and the most hospitable and much the most lavish in the matter of festivities that st petersburg could boast the bent and venerable major and mrs ward lawyer riverson the new notable from a distance next the bell of the village followed by a troop of lawn-clad and ribbon-decked young heartbreakers then all the young clerks in town in a body for they had stood in the vestibule sucking their cane heads a circling wall of oiled and simpering admirers till the last girl had run their gauntlet and last of all came the model boy willie mufferson taking as heedful care of his mother as if she were cut glass he always brought his mother to church and was the pride of all the matrons the boys all hated him he was so good and besides he had been thrown up to them so much his white handkerchief was hanging out his pocket behind as usual on sundays accidentally tom had no handkerchief and he looked upon boys who had as snobs the congregation being fully assembled now the bell rang once more to warn laggards and stragglers and then a solemn hush fell upon the church which was only broken by the tittering and whispering of the choir in the gallery the choir always tittered and whispered all through the service there was once a church choir that was not ill-bred but i have forgotten where it was now it was a great many years ago and i can scarcely remember anything about it but i think it was in some foreign country the minister gave out the hymn and read it through with a relish and a peculiar style which was much admired in that part of the country his voice began on a medium key and climbed steadily up till it reached a certain point or it bore with strong emphasis upon the topmost word and then plunged down as if from a springboard shall i be carried to the skies on flowery beds of ease whilst others fight to win the prize and sail through bloody seas he was regarded as a wonderful reader at church sociables he was always called upon to read poetry and when he was through the ladies would lift up their hands and let them fall helplessly in their laps and wall their eyes and shake their heads as much as to say words cannot express it it is too beautiful too beautiful for this mortal earth after the hymn had been sung the reverend mr sprague turned himself into a bulletin board and read off notices of meetings and societies and things till it seemed that the list would stretch out to the crack of doom a queer custom which is still kept up in america even in cities away here in this age of abundant newspapers often the less there is to justify a traditional custom the harder it is to get rid of it and now the minister prayed a good generous prayer it was and went into details it pleaded for the church and the little children of the church for the other churches of the village and for the village itself for the county for the state for the state offices for the united states for the churches of the united states for congress for the president 
for the officers of the government, for poor sailors tossed by stormy seas, for the oppressed millions groaning under the heel of European monarchies and oriental despotisms, for such as have the light and the good tidings, and yet have not eyes to see nor ears to hear withal, for the heathen in the far islands of the sea, and closed with a supplication that the words he was about to speak might find grace and favour, and be as seed sown in fertile ground, yielding in time a grateful harvest of good. Amen. There was a rustling of dresses, and the standing congregation sat down. The boy whose history this book relates did not enjoy the prayer. He only endured it, if he even did that much. He was restive all through it. He kept tally of the details of the prayer, unconsciously, for he was not listening, but he knew the ground of old and the clergyman's regular roots over it. And when a little trifle of new matter was interlarded, his ear detected it, and his whole nature resented it. He considered additions unfair and scoundrelly. In the midst of the prayer a fly had lit on the back of the pew in front of him and tortured his spirit by calmly rubbing its hands together, embracing its head with its arms, and polishing it so vigorously that it seemed to almost part company with the body, and the slender thread of a neck was exposed to view, scraping its wings with its hind legs and smoothing them to its body as if they had been coat-tails, going through its whole toilet as tranquilly as if it knew it was perfectly safe. As indeed it was, for as sorely as Tom's hands itched to grab for it, they did not dare. He believed his soul would be instantly destroyed if he did such a thing while the prayer was going on. But with the closing sentence his hand began to curve and steal forward, and the instant the amen was out the fly was a prisoner of war. His aunt detected the act and made him let it go. The minister gave out his text, and droned along monotonously through an argument that was so prosy that many a head by and by began to nod, and yet it was an argument that dealt in limitless fire and brimstone, and thinned the predestined elect down to a company so small as to be hardly worth the saving. Tom counted the pages of the sermon. After church he always knew how many pages there had been but he seldom knew anything else about the discourse. However, this time he was really interested for a little while. The minister made a grand and moving picture of the assembling together of the world's hosts at the millennium, when the lion and the lamb should lie down together, and a little child should lead them. But the pathos, the lesson, the moral of the great spectacle were lost upon the boy. He only thought of the conspicuousness of the principal character before the onlooking nations, his face lit with the thought, and he said to himself that he wished he could be that child, if it was a tame lion. Now he lapsed into suffering again, as the dry argument was resumed. Presently he bethought him of a treasure he had, and got it out. It was a large black beetle with formidable jaws, a pinch-bug, he called it. It was in a percussion-cap box. The first thing the beetle did was to take him by the finger. A natural fillip followed, the beetle went floundering into the aisle and lit on its back, and the hurt finger went into the boy's mouth. The beetle lay there, working its helpless legs, unable to turn over. Tom eyed it and longed for it, but it was safe out of his reach. Other people, uninterested in the sermon, found relief in the beetle, and they eyed it too. Presently a vagrant poodle-dog came idling by, sad at heart, lazy with the summer softness and the quiet weary of captivity, sighing for change. He spied the beetle, the drooping tail lifted and wagged. He surveyed the prize, walked around it, smelled at it from a safe distance, walked around it again, grew bolder, and took a closer smell. Then lifted up his lip and began a gingerly snatch at it, just missing it made another, and another, began to enjoy the diversion, subsided to his stomach with the beetle between his paws, and continued his experiments, grew weary at last, and then indifferent and absent-minded. His head nodded, and little by little his chin descended and touched the enemy, who seized it. 
There was a sharp yelp, a flirt of the poodle's head, and the beetle fell a couple of yards away and lit on his back once more. The neighboring spectators shook with gentle inward joy. Several faces went behind fans and handkerchiefs, and Tom was entirely happy. The dog looked foolish, and probably felt so, but there was resentment in his heart, too, and a craving for revenge. So he went to the beetle and began a wary attack on it again, jumping at it from every point of a circle, lighting with his four paws within an inch of the creature, making even closer snatches at it with his teeth, and jerking his head till his ears flapped again. But he grew tired once more after a while, tried to amuse himself with a fly, but found no relief, followed an ant around with his nose close to the floor, and quickly wearied of that yawned, sighed, forgot that beetle entirely, and sat down on it. Then there was a wild yelp of agony, and the poodle went sailing up the aisle. The yelps continued, and so did the dog. He crossed the house in front of the altar. He flew down the other aisle. He crossed before the doors. He clambered up the home stretch. His anguish grew with his progress, till presently he was but a woolly comet moving in its orbit with the gleam and the speed of light. At last the frantic sufferer sheared from its course and sprang into its master's lap. He flung it out of the window, and the voice of distress quickly thinned away and died in the distance. By this time the whole church was red-faced and suffocating with suppressed laughter, and the sermon had come to a dead standstill. The discourse was resumed presently, but it went lame and halting, all possibility of impressiveness being at an end for even the gravest sentiments were constantly being received with a smothered burst of unholy mirth under cover of some remote pew-back as if the poor parson had said a really facetious thing it was a genuine relief to the whole congregation when the ordeal was over and the benediction pronounced tom sawyer went home quite cheerful thinking to himself that there was some satisfaction about divine service when there was a bit of variety in it he had but one marring thought. He was willing that the dog should play with his pinch-bug, but he did not think it was upright in him to carry it off. End of chapter 5《Chapter 6 of The Adventures of Tom Sawyer by Mark Twain this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 6. Self-Examination, Dentistry, The Midnight Charm, Witches and Devils, Cautious Approaches, Happy Hours. Monday morning found Tom Sawyer miserable. Monday morning always found him so, because it began another week's slow suffering in school. He generally began that day with wishing he had had no intervening holiday. It made going into captivity and fetters again so much more odious. Tom lay thinking. Presently it occurred to him that he wished he was sick. Then he could stay home from school. Here was a vague possibility. He canvassed his system. No ailment was found, and he investigated again. This time he thought he could detect colicky symptoms, and he began to encourage them with considerable hope. But they soon grew feeble, and presently died wholly away. He reflected further. Suddenly he discovered something. One of his upper front teeth was loose. This was lucky. He was about to begin to groan, as a starter, as he called it, when it occurred to him that if he came into court with that argument his aunt would pull it out, and that would hurt. So he thought he would hold the tooth in reserve for the present and seek further. Nothing offered for some little time, and then he remembered hearing the doctor tell about a certain thing that laid up a patient for two or three weeks and threatened to make him lose a finger. So the boy eagerly drew his sore toe from under the sheet and held it up for inspection but now he did not know the necessary symptoms. However, it seemed well worth while to chance it, so he fell to groaning with considerable spirit. But Sid slept on unconscious. 
Tom groaned louder, and fancied that he began to feel pain in the toe. No result from Sid. Tom was panting with his exertions by this time. He took a rest, and then swelled himself up and fetched a succession of admirable groans. Sid snored on. Tom was aggravated. He said, Sid! Sid! and shook him. This course worked well, and Tom began to groan again. Sid yawned, stretched, then brought himself up on his elbow with a snort, and began to stare at Tom. Tom went on groaning. Sid said, Tom! Say, Tom! No response. Here, Tom! Tom! What is the matter, Tom? And he shook him and looked in his face anxiously. Tom moaned out, Oh, don't, Sid! Don't joggle me! Why, what's the matter, Tom? I must call Auntie. No, never mind. It'll be over by and by, maybe. Don't call anybody. But I must. Don't groan so, Tom. It's awful. How long you been this way? Hours. Ouch! Oh, don't stir so, Sid. You'll kill me. Tom, why didn't you wake me sooner? Oh, Tom, don't. It makes my flesh crawl to hear you. Tom, what is the matter? I forgive you everything, Sid. Oh, everything you've ever done to me. When I'm gone. Oh, Tom, you ain't dying, are you? Don't, Tom. Oh, don't. Baby. I forgive everybody, Sid. Oh, tell them so, Sid. And, Sid, you give my window sash and my cat with one eye to that new girl that's come to town and tell her. But Sid had snatched his clothes and gone. Tom was suffering in reality now, so handsomely was his imagination working, and so his groans had gathered quite a genuine tone. Sid flew downstairs and said, Oh, Aunt Polly, come! Tom's dying! Dying? Yes, am Don't wait! Come quick! Rubbish. I don't believe it. But she fled upstairs nevertheless, with Sid and Mary at her heels, and her face grew white, too, and her lip trembled. When she reached the bedside, she gasped out, You! Tom! Tom, what's the matter with you? Oh, Auntie, I'm— um... What's the matter with you? What is the matter with you, child? Oh, Auntie, my sore toe's mortified. The old lady sank down into a chair and laughed a little, then cried a little, then did both together. This restored her, and she said, Tom, what a turn you did give me. Now you shut up that nonsense and climb out of this. The groans ceased, and the pain vanished from the toe. The boy felt a little foolish, and he said, Aunt Polly, it seemed mortified, and it hurt so I never minded my tooth at all. Your tooth, indeed? What's the matter with your tooth? One of them's loose, and it aches perfectly awful. There, there, now, don't begin that groaning again. Open your mouth. Well, your tooth is loose, but you're not going to die about that. Mary, get me a silk thread and a chunk of fire out of the kitchen. Tom said, Oh, please, Auntie, don't pull it out. It don't hurt any more. I wish I may never stir if it does. Please don't, Auntie. I don't want to stay home from school. Oh, you don't, don't you? So all this row was because you thought you'd get to stay home from school and go a-fishing. Tom, Tom, I love you so, and you seem to try every way you can to break my old heart with your outrageousness. By this time the dental instruments were ready. The old lady made one end of the silk thread fast to Tom's tooth with a loop, and tied the other to the bedpost. Then she seized the chunk of fire, and suddenly thrust it almost into the boy's face. The tooth hung, dangling by the bedpost now. But all trials bring their compensations. As Tom went into school after breakfast, he was the envy of every boy he met because the gap in his upper row of teeth enabled him to expectorate in a new and admirable way. He gathered quite a following of lads interested in the exhibition, and one that had cut his finger and had been a center of fascination and homage up to this time now found himself suddenly without an adherent and shorn of his glory. His heart was heavy, and he said, with a disdain which he did not feel, that it wasn't anything to spit like Tom Sawyer. 
but another boy said sour grapes and he wandered away a dismantled hero shortly tom came upon the juvenile pariah of the village huckleberry finn son of the town drunkard huckleberry was cordially hated and dreaded by all the mothers of the town because he was idle and lawless and vulgar and bad and because all their children admired him so and delighted in his forbidden society and wished they dared to be like him tom was like the rest of the respectable boys in that he envied huckleberry his gaudy outcast condition and was under strict orders not to play with him so he played with him every time he got a chance huckleberry was always dressed in the cast-off clothes of full-grown men and they were in perennial bloom and fluttering with rags his hat was a vast ruin with a wide crescent lopped out of its brim his coat when he wore one hung nearly to his heels and had the rearward buttons far down the back but one suspender supported his trousers the seat of the trousers bagged low and contained nothing the fringed legs dragged in the dirt when not rolled up huckleberry came and went at his own free will he slept on doorsteps in fine weather and empty hogsheads in wet he did not have to go to school or to church or call any being master or obey anybody he could go fishing or swimming when and where he chose and stay as long as it suited him nobody forbade him to fight he could sit up as late as he pleased he was always the first boy that went barefoot in the spring and the last to resume leather in the fall he never had to wash nor put on clean clothes he could swear wonderfully in a word everything that goes to make life precious that boy had so thought every harassed hampered respectable boy in st petersburg tom hailed the romantic outcast hello huckleberry hello yourself and see how you like it what's that you got dead cat let me see him huck my he's pretty stiff where'd you get him bought him off in a boy what did you give i give a blue ticket and a bladder that i got at the slaughter house where'd you get the blue ticket bought it off in ben rogers two weeks ago for a hoop stick say what's dead cats good for huck good for cure warts with no is that so I know something that's better. I bet you don't. What is it? Why, well, spunk water. Spunk water? I wouldn't give a dern for spunk water. You wouldn't, wouldn't you? Do you ever try it? No, I hain't, but Bob Tanner did. Who told you so? Why, he told Jeff Thatcher, and Jeff told Johnny Baker, and Johnny told Jim Hollis and jim told ben rogers and ben told a nigger and the nigger told me there now well what of that they all lie leastways all but the nigger i don't know him but i never see a nigger that wouldn't lie shucks now you tell how bob tanner done it huck why he took and dipped his hand in a rotten stump where the rain water was in the daytime certainly with his face to the stump yes least i reckon so did he say anything i don't reckon he did i don't know aha talk about trying to cure warts with spunk water such a blame fool way as that why that ain't a going to do any good you got to go all by yourself to the middle of the woods where you know there's a spunk water stump and just as it's midnight you back up against the stump and jam your hand in and say barley corn barley corn engine meal shorts spunk water spunk water swallow these warts and then walk away quick eleven steps with your eyes shut and then turn round three times and walk home without speaking to anybody because if you speak the charm's busted well that sounds like a good way but it ain't the way bob tanner done no sir you can bet he didn't because he's the wartiest boy in this town and he wouldn't have a wart on him if he'd knowed how to work spunk water i've took off thousands of warts off my hands that way huck i play with frogs so much i've always got considerable many warts sometimes i take em off with a bean yes beans good i've done that have you what's your way you take and split the bean and cut the wart so as to get some blood and then you put the blood on one piece of the bean and take and dig a hole and bury it about midnight at the crossroads in the dark of the moon and then you burn up the rest of the bean you see that piece that's got the blood on it will keep drawing and drawing trying to fetch the other piece to it and so that helps the blood to draw the wart and pretty soon off she comes yes that's it huck that's it 
so when you're burying it, if you say, Down bean all fork, come no more to bother me, it's better. That's the way Joe Harper does, and he's been nearly to Coonville and most everywheres. But say, how do you cure him with dead cats? Why, you take your cat and go and get in the graveyard long about midnight, when somebody that was wicked has been buried, and when it's midnight a devil will come, or maybe two or three, but you can't see em, you can only hear something like the wind, or maybe hear em talk. And when they're taking that feller away, you heave your cat after em and say, Devil follow corpse, cat follow devil, warts follow cat, I'm done with ye. That'll fetch any wart. Sounds right. You ever try it, Huck? No, but old Mother Hopkins told me. Well, I reckon it's so, then, cause they say she's a witch. Say, why, Tom, I know she is. She's witched Pap. Pap says so his own self. He come along one day, and he see she was a witching him, so he took up a rock, and if she hadn't dodged, he'd a got her. Well, that very night he rolled off in a shed where he was a lion drunk, and broke his arm. Well, that's awful. How did he know she was a witch in him? Lord, Pap can tell easy. Pap says when they keep looking at you right steady, they're a-witching you, specially if they mumble, because when they mumble they're saying the Lord's Prayer backwards. Say, Hucky, when you going to try the cat? Tonight. I reckon they'll come after old Hoss Williams tonight. But they buried him Saturday. Didn't they get him Saturday night? Why, how you talk! How could their charms work till midnight? And then it's Sunday. Devils don't slosh around much of a Sunday, I don't reckon. I never thought of that. That's so. Let me go with you? Of course, if you ain't afeard. Afeard? Tain't likely. Will you meow? Yes, and you meow back if you get a chance. Last time you kept me a meowin' around till old Hayes went to throwin' rocks at me and says, Dern that cat, and so I hove a brick through his window, but don't you tell. I won't. I couldn't meow that night, because Auntie was watchin' me, but I'll meow this time. Say, what's that? Nothing but a tick. Where'd you get him? Out in the woods. What do you take for him? I don't know. I don't want to sell him. All right. It's a mighty small tick, anyway. Oh, anybody can run a tick down that don't belong to them. I'm satisfied with it. It's a good enough tick for me. Sure, there's ticks a-plenty. I could have a thousand of them if I wanted to. Well, why don't you? Because you know mighty well you can't. This is a pretty early tick, I reckon. It's the first one I've seen this year. Say, Huck, I'll give you my tooth for him. Let's see it. Tom got out a bit of paper and carefully unrolled it. Huckleberry viewed it wistfully. The temptation was very strong. At last, he said, Is it genuine? Tom lifted his lip and showed the vacancy. Well, all right, said Huckleberry. It's a trade. Tom enclosed the tick in the percussion cap box that lately had been the pinch bug's prison, and the boys separated, each feeling wealthier than before. When Tom reached the little isolated frame schoolhouse, he strode in briskly, with the banner of one who had come with all honest speed. He hung his hat on a peg and flung himself into his seat with business-like alacrity. The master, throned on high in his great splint-bottom armchair, was dozing, lulled by the drowsy hum of study. The interruption roused him. Thomas Sawyer. Tom knew that when his name was pronounced in full, it meant trouble. Sir. Come up here. Now, sir, why are you late again, as usual? Tom was about to take refuge in a lie when he saw two long tails of yellow hair hanging down a back that he recognized by the electric sympathy of love, and by that form was the only vacant place on the girl's side of the schoolhouse. He instantly said, I stopped to talk with Huckleberry Finn. The master's pulse stood still, and he stared helplessly. The buzz of study ceased. The pupils wondered if this foolhardy boy had lost his mind. The master said, You, you did what? Stop to talk with Huckleberry Finn. There was no mistaking the words. Thomas Sawyer, this is the most astounding confession I have ever listened to. 
no mere feral will answer for this offence take off your jacket the master's arm performed until it was tired and the stock of switches notably diminished then the order followed now sir go and sit with the girls and let this be a warning to you the titter that rippled around the room appeared to abash the boy but in reality that result was caused rather more by his worshipful awe of his unknown idol and the dread pleasure that lay in his high good fortune he sat down upon the end of the pine bench and the girl hitched herself away from him with a toss of her head nudges and winks and whispers traversed the room but tom sat still with his arms upon the long low desk before him and seemed to study his book by and by attention ceased from him and the accustomed school murmur rose upon the dull air once more presently the boy began to steal furtive glances at the girl she observed it made a mouth at him and gave him the back of her head for the space of a minute when she cautiously faced around again a peach lay before her she thrust it away tom gently put it back she thrust it away again but with less animosity tom patiently returned it to its place then she let it remain tom scrawled on his slate please take it i got more the girl glanced at the words but made no sign now the boy began to draw something on the slate hiding his work with his left hand for a time the girl refused to notice but her human curiosity presently began to manifest itself by hardly perceptible signs the boy worked on apparently unconscious the girl made a sort of non-committal attempt to see but the boy did not betray that he was aware of it at last she gave in and hesitatingly whispered let me see it tom partly uncovered a dismal caricature of a house with two gable ends to it and a corkscrew of smoke issuing from the chimney then the girl's interest began to fasten itself upon the work and she forgot everything else when it was finished she gazed a moment then whispered it's nice make a man the artist erected a man in the front yard that resembled a derrick he could have stepped over the house but the girl was not hypercritical she was satisfied with the monster and whispered it's a beautiful man now make me coming along tom drew an hourglass with a full moon and straw limbs to it and armed the spreading fingers with a portentous fan the girl said it's ever so nice i wish i could draw it's easy whispered tom i'll learn you oh will you when at noon do you go home to dinner i'll stay if you will good that's a whack what's your name becky thatcher what's yours oh i know it's thomas sawyer that's the name they lick me by i'm tom when i'm good you call me tom will you yes now tom began to scrawl something on the slate hiding the words from the girl but she was not backward this time she begged to see tom said oh it ain't anything yes it is no it ain't you don't want to see it yes i do indeed i do please let me you'll tell no i won't deed and deed and double deed won't you won't tell anybody at all ever as long as you live no i won't ever tell anybody now let me oh you don't want to see now that you treat me so i will see she put her small hand upon his and a little scuffle ensued tom pretending to resist in earnest but letting his hand slip by degrees till these words were revealed i love you oh you bad thing and she hit his hand a smart rap but reddened and looked pleased nevertheless just at this juncture the boy felt a slow fateful grip closing on his ear and a steady lifting impulse in that wise he was borne across the house and deposited in his own seat under a peppering fire of giggles from the whole school 
then the master stood over him during a few awful moments and finally moved away to his throne without saying a word but although tom's ear tingled his heart was jubilant as the school quieted down tom made an honest effort to study but the turmoil within him was too great in turn he took his place in the reading class and made a botch of it then in the geography class and turned lakes into mountains mountains into rivers and rivers into continents till chaos was come again then in the spelling class and got turned down by a succession of mere baby words till he brought up at the foot and yielded up the pewter medal which he had worn with ostentation for months End of chapter six Chapter Seven of The Adventures of Tom Sawyer by Mark Twain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Seven A Treaty Entered Into Early Lessons A Mistake Made. The harder Tom tried to fasten his mind on his book, the more his ideas wandered so at last with a sigh and a yawn he gave it up it seemed to him that the noon recess would never come the air was utterly dead there was not a breath stirring it was the sleepiest of sleepy days the drowsing murmur of the five-and-twenty studying scholars soothed the soul like the spell that is the murmur of bees away off in the flaming sunshine cardiff hill lifted its soft green sides through a shimmering veil of heat tinted with the purple of distance a few birds floated on lazy wing high in the air no other living thing was visible but some cows and they were asleep tom's heart ached to be free or else to have something of interest to do to pass the dreary time his hand wandered into his pocket and his face lit up with a glow of gratitude that was prayer though he did not know it then furtively the percussion cap box came out he released the tick and put him on the long flat desk the creature probably glowed with a gratitude that amounted to prayer too at this moment but it was premature for when he started thankfully to travel off tom turned him aside with a pin and made him take a new direction tom's bosom friend sat next to him suffering just as tom had been and now he was deeply and gratefully interested in this entertainment in an instant the bosom friend was joe harper the two boys were sworn friends all the week and embattled enemies on saturdays joe took a pin out of his lapel and began to assist in exercising the prisoner the sport grew in interest momently soon tom said that they were interfering with each other and neither getting the fullest benefit of the tick so he put joe's slate on the desk and drew a line down the middle of it from top to bottom now said he as long as he's on your side, you can stir him up, and I'll let him alone. But if you let him get away and get on my side, you're to leave him alone, as long as I can keep him from crossing over. All right. Go ahead, stir him up. The tick escaped from Tom presently and crossed the equator. Joe harassed him a while, and then he got away and crossed back again. This change of base occurred often. While one boy was worrying the tick with absorbing interest— the other would look on with interest as strong the two heads bowed together over the slate and the two souls dead to all things else at last luck seemed to settle and abide with joe the tick tried this that and the other course and got as excited and as anxious as the boys themselves but time and again just as he would have victory in his very grasp so to speak and tom's fingers would be twitching to begin joe's pin would deftly head him off and keep possession at last tom could stand it no longer the temptation was too strong so he reached out and lent a hand with his pin joe was angry in a moment said he tom you let him alone i only just want to stir him up a little joe no sir it ain't fear you just let him alone Blame it, I ain't gonna stir him much. Let him alone, I tell you. I won't. You shall. He's on my side of the line. Look 
here, Joe Harper. Whose is that tick? I don't care whose tick he is. He's on my side of the line, and you shan't touch him. Well, I just bet I will, though. He's my tick, and I'll do what I blame please with him or die. A tremendous whack came down on Tom's shoulders, and its duplicate on Joe's, and for the space of two minutes the dust continued to fly from the two jackets, and the whole school to enjoy it. The boys had been too absorbed to notice the hush that had stolen upon the school a while before the master came tiptoeing down the room and stood over them. He had contemplated a good part of the performance before he contributed his bit of variety to it. When school broke up at noon, Tom flew to Becky Thatcher and whispered in her ear, "'Put on your bonnet and let on you're going home, and when you get to the corner, give the rest of them the slip and turn down through the lane and come back. I'll go the other way and come it over em the same way." So the one went off with one group of scholars and the other with another. In a little while the two met at the bottom of the lane, and when they reached the school they had it all to themselves. Then they sat together with the slate before them, and Tom gave Becky the pencil and held her hand in his, guiding it, and so created another surprising house. When the interest in art began to wane, the two fell to talking. Tom was swimming in bliss. He said, Do you love rats? No, I hate them. Well, I do too, live ones, but I mean dead ones to swing round your head with a string. No, I don't care for rats much anyway. What I like is chewing gum. Oh, I should say so. I wish I had some now. Do you? I've got some. I'll let you chew it a while, but you must give it back to me. That was agreeable, so they chewed it turn about, and dangled their legs against the bench in excess of contentment. Was you ever at a circus? said Tom. Yes. And my pa's going to take me again some time, if I'm good. I've been to the circus three or four times, lots of times. Church ain't shucks to a circus. There's things going on at a circus all the time. I'm going to be a clown in the circus when I grow up. Oh, are you? That will be nice. They're so lovely, all spotted up. Yes, that's so. And they get slathers of money. Most a dollar a day, Ben Rogers says. Say, Becky. Was he ever engaged? What's that? Why, engaged to be married? No. Would you like to? I reckon so. I don't know. What is it like? Like? Well, it ain't like anything. You only just tell a boy you won't ever have anybody but him ever, 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 and then you kiss, and that's all. Anybody can do it. Kiss? What do you kiss for? Why, that, you know, is to... Well, they always do that. Everybody? Why, yes, everybody that's in love with each other. Do you remember what I wrote on the slate? Y yes What was it? I shan't tell you. Shall I tell you? Y yes but some other time. No, now. No, not now. Tomorrow. Oh, no, now. Please, Becky. I'll whisper it. I'll whisper it ever so easy. Becky hesitating, Tom took silence for consent, and passed his arm about her waist, and whispered the tale ever so softly, with his mouth close to her ear. And then he added, Now you whisper it to me just the same. She resisted for a while, and then said, You turn your face away so you can't see, and then I will. But you mustn't ever tell anybody. Will you, Tom? Now you won't, will you? No, indeed, indeed I won't. Now, Becky. He turned his face away. She bent timidly around till her breath stirred his curls and whispered, I love you. Then she sprang away and ran around and around the desks and benches with Tom after her and took refuge in a corner at last with her little white apron to her face. Tom clasped her around her neck and pleaded, Now, Becky, it's all done, all over but the kiss. Don't you be afraid of that. It ain't anything at all. Please, Becky. And he tugged at her apron and the hands. By and by she gave up and let her hands drop. Her face, all glowing with the struggle, came up and submitted. 
Tom kissed the red lips and said, Now it's all done, Becky. And after this, you know, you ain't ever to love anybody but me, and you ain't ever to marry anybody but me, ever, never, and forever. Will you? No, I'll never love anybody but you, Tom, and I'll never marry anybody but you, and you ain't to ever marry anybody but me, either. Certainly, of course. That's part of it. And always coming to school or when we're going home, you're to walk with me when there ain't anybody looking, and you choose me and I choose you at parties, because that's the way you do when you're engaged. It's so nice. I never heard of it before. Oh, it's ever so gay. Why, me and Amy Lawrence. The big eyes told Tom his blunder, and he stopped, confused. Oh, Tom, then I ain't the first you've ever been engaged to. The child began to cry. Tom said, Oh, don't cry, Becky. I don't care for her any more. Yes, you do, Tom. You know you do. Tom tried to put his arm about her neck, but she pushed him away and turned her face to the wall and went on crying. Tom tried again, with soothing words in his mouth, and was repulsed again. Then his pride was up, and he strode away and went outside. He stood about, restless and uneasy, for a while, glancing at the door every now and then, hoping she would repent and come to find him. But she did not. Then he began to feel badly and fear that he was in the wrong. It was a hard struggle with him to make new advances now, but he nerved himself to it and entered. She was still standing back there in the corner, sobbing with her face to the wall. Tom's heart smote him. He went to her and stood a moment, not knowing exactly how to proceed. Then he said, hesitatingly, Becky, I I don't care for anybody but you. No reply but sobs. Becky. Pleadingly. Becky, won't you say something? More sobs. Tom got out his chiefest jewel, a brass knob from the top of an andiron, and passed it around her so that she could see it, and said, Please, Becky, won't you take it? She struck it to the floor. Then Tom marched out of the school and over the hills and far away to return to school no more that day. Presently Becky began to suspect. She ran to the door. He was not in sight. She flew around to the play-yard. He was not there. Then she called. Tom! Come back, Tom! She listened intently, but there was no answer. She had no companions but silence and loneliness. So she sat down to cry again and upbraid herself, and by this time the scholars began to gather again, and she had to hide her griefs and still her broken heart, and take up the cross of a long, dreary, aching afternoon, with none among the strangers about her to exchange sorrows with. End of chapter 7 Chapter Eight of *The Adventures of Tom Sawyer* by Mark Twain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Eight. Tom decides on his course. Old scenes reenacted. Tom dodged hither and thither through lanes until he was well out of the track of returning scholars and then fell into a moody jog. He crossed a small branch two or three times because of a prevailing juvenile superstition that to cross water baffled pursuit. Half an hour later he was disappearing behind the Douglas mansion on the summit of Cardiff Hill, and the schoolhouse was hardly distinguishable away off in the valley behind him. He entered a dense wood, picked his pathless way to the centre of it, and sat down on a mossy spot under a spreading oak. There was not even a zephyr stirring. The dead noonday heat had even stilled the songs of the birds. Nature lay in a trance that was broken by no sound but the occasional far-off hammering of a woodpecker, and this seemed to render the pervading silence and sense of loneliness the more profound. The boy's soul was steeped in melancholy. His feelings were in happy accord with his surroundings. 
he sat long with his elbows on his knees and his chin in his hands meditating it seemed to him that life was but a trouble at best and he more than half envied jimmy hodges so lately released it must be very peaceful he thought to lie and slumber and dream for ever and ever with the wind whispering through the trees and caressing the grass and the flowers over the grave and nothing to bother and grieve about ever any more if he only had a clean sunday school record he would be willing to go and be done with it all now as to this girl what had he done nothing he had meant the best in the world and had been treated like a dog like a very dog she would be sorry some day maybe when it was too late ah if he could only die temporarily but the elastic heart of youth cannot be compressed into one constrained shape long at a time tom presently began to drift insensibly back into the concerns of this life again what if he turned his back now and disappeared mysteriously what if he went away ever so far away into unknown countries beyond the seas and never came back any more how would she feel then the idea of being a clown recurred to him now only to fill him with disgust for frivolity and jokes and spotted tights were an offence when they intruded themselves upon a spirit that was exalted into the vague august realm of the romantic no he would be a soldier and return after long years all war-worn and illustrious no better still he would join the indians and hunt buffaloes and go on the war-path in the mountain ranges and the trackless great plains of the far west and away in the future come back a great chief bristling with feathers hideous with paint and prance into sunday school some drowsy summer morning with a blood-curdling war-whoop and sear the eyeballs of all his companions with unappeasable envy but no there was something gaudier even than this he would be a pirate that was it now his future lay plain before him and glowing with unimaginable splendour how his name would fill the world and make people shudder how gloriously he would go ploughing the dancing seas in his long low black-hulled racer a spirit of the storm with his grisly flag flying at the fore and at the zenith of his fame how he would suddenly appear at the old village and stalk into church brown and weather-beaten in his black velvet doublet and trunks his great jack-boots his crimson sash his belt bristling with horse pistols his crime-rusted cutlass at his side his slouch hat with waving plumes his black flag unfurled with a skull and cross-bones on it and here with swelling ecstasy the whisperings it's tom sawyer the pirate the black avenger of the spanish main yes it was settled his career was determined he would run away from home and enter upon it he would start the very next morning therefore he must now begin to get ready he would collect his resources together he went to a rotten log near at hand and began to dig under one end of it with his barlow knife he soon struck wood that sounded hollow he put his hand there and uttered this incantation impressively what hasn't come here come what's here stay here then he scraped away the dirt and exposed a pine shingle he took it up and disclosed a shapely little treasure house whose bottom and sides were of shingles in it lay a marble tom's astonishment was boundless he scratched his head with a perplexed air and said well that beats anything then he tossed the marble away pettishly and stood cogitating the truth was that a superstition of his had failed here which he and all his comrades had always looked upon as infallible if you buried a marble with certain necessary incantations and left it alone a fortnight and then opened the place with the incantation he had just used you would find that all the marbles you had ever lost had gathered themselves together there meantime no matter how widely they had been separated 
but now this thing had actually and unquestionably failed tom's whole structure of faith was shaken to its foundations he had many a time heard of this thing succeeding but never of its failing before it did not occur to him that he had tried it several times before himself but could never find the hiding places afterward he puzzled over the matter some time and finally decided that some witch had interfered and broken the charm he thought he would satisfy himself on that point so he searched around till he found a small sandy spot with a little funnel-shaped depression in it he laid himself down and put his mouth close to this depression and called doodlebug doodlebug tell me what i want to know doodlebug doodlebug tell me what i want to know the sand began to work and presently a small black bug appeared for a second and then darted under again in a fright he dasn't tell so it was a witch that done it i just knowed it he well knew the futility of trying to contend against witches so he gave up discouraged but it occurred to him that he might as well have the marble he had just thrown away and therefore he went and made a patient search for it but he could not find it now he went back to his treasure-house and carefully placed himself just as he had been standing when he tossed the marble away then he took another marble from his pocket and tossed it in the same way saying brother go find your brother he watched where it stopped and went there and looked but it must have fallen short or gone too far so he tried twice more the last repetition was successful the two marbles lay within a foot of each other just here the blast of a toy tin trumpet came faintly down the green aisles of the forest tom flung off his jacket and trousers turned a suspender into a belt raked away some brush behind the rotten log disclosing a rude bow and arrow a lath sword and a tin trumpet and in a moment had seized these things and bounded away bare-legged with fluttering shirt he presently halted under a great elm blew an answering blast and then began to tiptoe and look warily out this way and that he said cautiously to an imaginary company hold my merry men keep hid till i blow now appeared joe harper as airily clad and elaborately armed as tom tom called hold who comes into sherwood forest without my pass guy of gisborne wants no man's pass who art thou that that there's to hold such language said tom prompting for they talked by the book from memory who art thou that dares to hold such language ah indeed i am robin hood as thy caitiff carcass soon shall know then art thou indeed that famous outlaw right gladly will i dispute with thee the passes of the merry wood have it thee they took their lath swords dumped their other traps on the ground struck a fencing attitude foot to foot and began a grave careful combat two up and two down presently tom said now if you've got the hang go it lively so they went it lively panting and perspiring with the work by and by tom shouted fall fall why don't you fall i shan't why don't you fall yourself you're getting the worst of it why that ain't anything i can't fall that ain't the way it is in the book the book says then with one backhanded stroke you slew poor guy giver you're to turn round and let me hit you in the back there was no getting around the authorities so joe turned received the whack and fell now said joe getting up you got to let me kill you that's fair why well, i can't do that it ain't in the book well it's plain mean that's all well say joe you can be friar tuck or much the miller's son and land me with a quarterstaff or i'll be the sheriff of nottingham and you be robin hood a little while and kill me this was satisfactory and so these adventures were carried out then tom became robin hood again and was allowed by the treacherous nun to bleed his strength away through his neglected wound and at last joe representing a whole tribe of weeping outlaws dragged him sadly forth gave his bow into his feeble hands and tom said where this arrow falls there bury poor robin hood under the greenwood tree 
Then he shot the arrow and fell back and would have died, but he lit on a nettle and sprang up too gaily for a corpse. The boys dressed themselves, hid their accoutrements, and went off grieving that there were no outlaws any more, and wondering what modern civilization could claim to have done to compensate for their loss. They said they would rather be outlaws a year in Sherwood Forest than President of the United States forever. End of chapter 8《Chapter Nine of the Adventures of Tom Sawyer by Mark Twain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Nine: A Solemn Situation. Grave Subjects Introduced. Injun Joe Explains. At half-past nine that night Tom and Sid were sent to bed, as usual. They said their prayers, and Sid was soon asleep. Tom lay awake and waited, in restless impatience. When it seemed to him that it must be nearly daylight, he heard the clock strike ten. This was despair. He would have tossed and fidgeted, as his nerves demanded, but he was afraid he might wake Sid so he lay still and stared up into the dark everything was dismally still by and by out of the stillness little scarcely perceptible noises began to emphasize themselves the ticking of the clock began to bring itself into notice old beams began to crack mysteriously the stairs creaked faintly evidently spirits were abroad a measured, muffled snore issued from Aunt Polly's chamber, and now the tiresome chirping of a cricket that no human ingenuity could locate began. Next, the ghastly ticking of a death watch in the wall at the bed's head made Tom shudder. It meant that somebody's days were numbered. Then the howl of a far-off dog rose on the night air, and was answered by a fainter howl from a remoter distance. Tom was in an agony. At last he was satisfied that time had ceased and eternity begun. He began to doze in spite of himself. The clock chimed eleven, but he did not hear it. And then there came, mingling with his half-formed dreams, a most melancholy caterwauling. The raising of a neighboring window disturbed him, a cry of, "'Scat, you devil!' and the crash of an empty bottle against the back of his aunt's woodshed brought him wide awake, and a single minute later he was dressed and out of the window and creeping along the roof of the L on all fours. He meowed with caution once or twice as he went, then jumped to the roof of the woodshed and thence to the ground. Huckleberry Finn was there with his dead cat, the boys moved off and disappeared in the gloom. At the end of half an hour they were wading through the tall grass of the graveyard. It was a graveyard of the old-fashioned western kind. It was on a hill about a mile and a half from the village. It had a crazy board fence around it, which leaned inward in places and outward the rest of the time, but stood upright nowhere. Grass and weeds grew rank over the whole cemetery. All the old graves were sunken in. There was not a tombstone on the place. Round-topped, worm-eaten boards staggered over the graves, leaning for support and finding none. Sacred to the memory of so-and-so had been painted on them once, but it could no longer have been read on the most of them now, even if there had been light. A faint wind moaned through the trees, and Tom feared it might be the spirits of the dead, complaining at being disturbed. The boys talked little, and only under their breath, for the time and the place and the pervading solemnity and silence oppressed their spirits. They found the sharp new heap they were seeking, and ensconced themselves within the protection of three great elms that grew in a bunch within a few feet of the grave. Then they waited in silence for what seemed a long time. 
the hooting of a distant owl was the only sound that troubled the dead stillness tom's reflections grew oppressive he must force some talk so he said in a whisper hucky do you believe the dead people like it for us to be here huckleberry whispered i wished i knowed it's awful solemn like ain't it i bet it is there was a considerable pause while the boys canvassed this matter inwardly then tom whispered say hucky do you reckon hoss williams hears us talking a course he does least his spirit does tom after a pause i wish i'd said mr williams but i never meant any harm everybody calls him hoss a body can't be too particular about how they talk about these here dead people tom this was a damper and conversation died again presently tom seized his comrade's arm and said what is it tom and the two clung together with beating hearts there it is again didn't you hear it i there now you hear it lord tom they're coming they're coming sure what'll we do i don't know think they'll see us oh tom they can see in the dark same as cats i wished i hadn't come oh don't be afeard i don't believe they'll bother us we ain't doing any harm if we keep perfectly still maybe they won't notice us at all i'll try to tom but lord i'm all of a shiver listen the boys bent their heads together and scarcely breathed a muffled sound of voices floated up from the far end of the graveyard look see there whispered tom what is that it's devil fire oh tom this is awful some vague figures approached through the gloom swinging an old-fashioned tin lantern that freckled the ground with innumerable little spangles of light presently huckleberry whispered with a shudder it's the devils sure enough three of em lordy tom we're goners can you pray i'll try but don't you be afeard they ain't gonna hurt us now i lay me down to sleep i shh what is it huck they're humans one of em is anyway one of em's old muff potter's voice no tain't so is it i bet i know it don't you stir nor budge he ain't sharp enough to notice us drunk the same as usual likely blamed old rip all right i'll keep still now they're stuck can't find it here they come again now they're hot cold again hot again red hot they're pointed right this time say huck i know another of them voices it's injun joe that's so that murderin half-breed i'd rather they was devils a durn sight what can they be up to the whisper died wholly out now for the three men had reached the grave and stood within a few feet of the boy's hiding place here it is said the third voice and the owner of it held the lantern up and revealed the face of young dr robinson potter and injun joe were carrying a hand-barrow with a rope and a couple of shovels on it they cast down their load and began to open the grave the doctor put the lantern at the head of the grave and came and sat down with his back against one of the elm trees he was so close the boys could have touched him hurry men he said in a low voice the moon might come out at any moment they growled a response and went on digging for some time there was no noise but the grating sound of the spades discharging their freight of mould and gravel it was very monotonous finally a spade struck upon the coffin with a dull woody accent and within another minute or two the men had hoisted it out on the ground they pried off the lid with their shovels got out the body and dumped it rudely on the ground the moon drifted from behind the clouds and exposed the pallid face the barrow was got ready and the corpse placed on it covered with a blanket and bound to its place with the rope potter took out a large spring knife and cut off the dangling end of the rope and then said now the cursed thing's ready sawbones and you'll just out with another five or here she stays that's the talk said injun joe 
"'Look here, what does this mean?' said the doctor. "'You required your pay in advance, and I've paid you.' "'Yes, and you've done more than that,' said Injun Joe, approaching the doctor, who was now standing. Five years ago you drove me away from your father's kitchen one night, when I come to ask for something to eat. And you said I weren't there for any good. And when I swore I'd get even with you if it took a hundred years, your father had me jailed for a vagrant. Did you think I'd forget? The Injun blood ain't in me for nothing. And now I've got you, and you've got to settle, you know? He was threatening the doctor with a fist in his face by this time. The doctor struck out suddenly and stretched the ruffian on the ground. Potter dropped his knife and exclaimed, Here now, don't you hit my part. And the next moment he had grappled with the doctor, and the two were struggling with might and main, trampling the grass and tearing the ground with their heels. Injun Joe sprang to his feet, his eyes flaming with passion, snatched up Potter's knife, and went creeping, cat-like and stooping, round and round about the combatants, seeking an opportunity. All at once the doctor flung himself free, seized the heavy headboard of Williams's grave, and felled Potter to the earth with it. And in the same instant the half-breed saw his chance, and drove the knife to the hilt in the young man's breast. He reeled and fell partly upon Potter, flooding him with his blood, and in the same moment the clouds blotted out the dreadful spectacle, and the two frightened boys were speeding away in the dark. Presently, when the moon emerged again, Injun Joe was standing over the two forms, contemplating them. The doctor murmured inarticulately, gave a long gasp or two, and was still. The half-breed muttered, "'That score is settled, damn you!' Then he robbed the body, after which he put the fatal knife in Potter's open right hand, and sat down on the dismantled coffin. Three, four, five minutes passed, and then Potter began to stir and moan. His hand closed upon the knife, he raised it, glanced at it, and let it fall with a shudder. Then he sat up, pushing the body from him, and gazed at it, and then around him, confusedly. His eyes met Joe's. "'Lord, how is this, Joe?' he said. "'It's dirty business,' said Joe, without moving. "'What did you do it for?' "'I—I I never done it.' "'Look here, that kind of talk won't wash.' Potter trembled and grew white. I thought I'd got sober. I'd no business to drink tonight. But it's in my head yet, worse than when we started here. I'm all in a muddle. Can't relect anything of it, hardly. Tell me, Joe, honest now, old fella. Did I do it? Joe, I never meant to. Pawn my soul and honor, I never meant to, Joe. Tell me how it was, Joe. Oh, it's awful. And him so young and promising. Why, you two was scuffling, and he fetched you one with the headboard, and you fell flat, and then up you come, all reeling and staggering like, and snatched the knife and jammed it into him, just as he fetched you another awful clip, and here you've laid as dead as a wedge till now. Oh, I didn't know what I was a-doing. I wish I may die this minute if I did. It was all on account of the whiskey and the excitement, I reckon. I never used a weapon in my life before, Joe. I fought, but never with weapons. They'll say that, Joe. Oh, don't tell. Say you won't tell, Joe. That's a good feller. I always liked you, Joe, and stood up for you, too. Don't you remember? You won't tell, will you, Joe? and the poor creature dropped on his knees before the stolid murderer and clasped his appealing hands. No, you've always been fair and square with me, Muff Potter, and I won't go back on you. There, now, it's as fair as a man can say. Oh, Joe, you're an angel. I'll bless you for the longest day I live. And Potter began to cry. 
come now, that's enough of that. This ain't any time for blubbering. You be off yonder way, and I'll go this. Move now, and don't leave any tracks behind you. Potter started on a trot that quickly increased to a run. The half-breed stood looking after him. He muttered, If he's as much stunned with the lick and fuddled with the rum as he had the look of being, he won't think of the knife till he's gone so far he'll be afraid to come back after it to such a place by himself. Chicken heart. Two or three minutes later the murdered man, the blanketed corpse, the lidless coffin, and the open grave were under no inspection but the moon's. The stillness was complete again, too. End of chapter 9CHAPTER Ten OF THE ADVENTURES OF TOM SAWYER BY MARK TWAIN This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. CHAPTER Ten: THE SOLEMN OATH TERROR BRINGS REPENTANCE MENTAL PUNISHMENT the two boys flew on and on toward the village, speechless with horror. They glanced backward over their shoulders from time to time apprehensively, as if they feared they might be followed. Every stump that started up in their path seemed a man and an enemy, and made them catch their breath, and as they sped by some outlying cottages that lay near the village, the barking of the aroused watchdogs seemed to give wings to their feet. We can only get to the old tannery before we break down," whispered Tom, in short catches between breaths. I can't stand it much longer. Huckleberry's hard pantings were his only reply, and the boys fixed their eyes on the goal of their hopes, and bent to their work to win it. They gained steadily on it, and at last, breast to breast, they burst through the open door and fell grateful and exhausted in the sheltering shadows beyond. By and by their pulses slowed down, and Tom whispered, Huckleberry, what do you reckon will come of this? If Dr. Robinson dies, I reckon hanging will come of it. Do you, though? Why, I know it, Tom. Tom thought a while, then he said, Who tell we? What are you talking about? Suppose something happened and Injun Joe didn't hang. Why, he'd kill us some time or other, just as dead sure as we are a-laying here. That's just what I was thinking to myself, Huck. If anybody tells, let Muff Potter do it, if he's fool enough. He's generally drunk enough. Tom said nothing, went on thinking. Presently he whispered, Huck, Muff Potter don't know it. How can he tell? What's the reason he don't know it? Because he just got that whack when Injun Joe done it. Do you reckon he could see anything? Do you reckon he knowed anything? By hokey, that's so, Tom. And besides, look a here. Maybe that whack done for him. No, taint likely, Tom. He had liquor in him. I could see that. And besides, he always has. Well, when Pap's full, you might take and belt him over the head with a church, and you couldn't faze him. He says so his own self. So it's the same with Muff Potter, of course. But if a man was dead sober, I reckon maybe that whack might fetch him. I don't know. After another reflective silence, Tom said, Hucky, are you sure you can keep Mum? Tom, we got to keep Mum. You know that. That Injun devil wouldn't make any more of drowning us than a couple of cats if we was to speak about this and they didn't hang him. Now look a here, Tom, let's take and swear to one another. That's what we got to do. Swear to keep mum. I'm agreed. It's the best thing. Would you just hold hands and swear that we... Oh, no, that wouldn't do for this. That's good enough for little rubbishy common things, especially with gals, cause they go back on you anyway and blab if they get in a huff. But there ought to be writing about a big thing like this, and blood. Tom's whole being applauded this idea. It was deep and dark and awful. 
the hour the circumstances the surroundings were in keeping with it he picked up a clean pine shingle that lay in the moonlight took a little fragment of bread keel out of his pocket got the moon on his work and painfully scrawled these lines emphasizing each slow downstroke by clamping his tongue between his teeth and letting up the pressure on the upstrokes huck finn and tom sawyer swears they will keep mum about this and they wish they may drop down dead in their tracks if they ever tell and rot huckleberry was filled with admiration of tom's facility in writing and the sublimity of his language he at once took a pin from his lapel and was going to prick his flesh but tom said hold on don't do that a pin's brass it might have verdigris on it what's verdigris it's poison that's what it is you just swallow some of it once you'll see so tom unwound the thread from one of his needles each boy pricked the ball of his thumb and squeezed out a drop of blood in time after many squeezes tom managed to sign his initials using the ball of his little finger for a pen then he showed huckleberry how to make an h and an f and the oath was complete they buried the shingle close to the wall with some dismal ceremonies and incantations and the fetters that bound their tongues were considered to be locked and the key thrown away a figure crept stealthily through a break in the other end of the ruined building now but they did not notice it tom whispered huckleberry does this keep us from ever telling always of course it does it don't make any difference what happens we got to keep mum we drop down dead don't you know that yes i reckon that's so they continued to whisper for some little time presently a dog set up a long lugubrious howl just outside within ten feet of them the boys clasped each other suddenly in an agony of fright which of us does he mean gasped huckleberry i don't know peep through the crack quick no you tom i can't i can't do it huck please tom there tis again oh lordy i'm thankful whispered tom I know his voice. It's Bull Harbison. If Mr. Harbison owned a slave named Bull, Tom would have spoken of him as Harbison's Bull. But a son or a dog of that name was Bull Harbison. Oh, that's good. I tell you, Tom, I was most scared to death. I'd have bet anything it was a stray dog. The dog howled again. The boy's hearts sank once more. Oh, my, that ain't no Bull Harbison whispered huckleberry do tom tom quaking with fear yielded and put his eye to the crack his whisper was hardly audible when he said oh huck it's a stray dog quick tom quick who does he mean huck he must mean us both we're right together oh tom i reckon we're goners i reckon there ain't no mistake about where i'll go to i been so wicked dad fetch it this comes to playing hooky and doing everything a fellow's told not to do i might have been good like sid if i'd have tried but no i wouldn't of course but if ever i get off this time i lay out just waller in sunday school and tom began to snuffle a little you bad and huckleberry began to snuffle too consound it tom sawyer you're just old pie long side of what i am oh lordy 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 i wished i had only half your chance tom choked off and whispered look hucky look he's got his back to us hucky looked with joy in his heart well he has by jingoes did he before yes he did but i like a fool never thought oh this is bully you know now who can he mean the howling stopped tom pricked up his ears Shh, what's that he whispered sounds like like hogs grunting no it's somebody snoring tom that is it whereabouts is it huck i believe it's down at t'other end sounds so anyway pap used to sleep there sometimes long with the hogs but laws bless you he just lifts things when he snores 
besides i reckon he ain't ever coming back to this town any more the spirit of adventure rose in the boys souls once more hucky do you dast go if i lead i don't like to much tom s'pose it's injun joe tom quailed but presently the temptation rose up strong again and the boys agreed to try with the understanding that they would take to their heels if the snoring stopped so they went tiptoeing stealthily down the one behind the other when they had got to within five steps of the snore tom stepped on a stick and it broke with a sharp snap the man moaned writhed a little and his face came into the moonlight it was muff potter the boys hearts had stood still and their hopes too when the man moved but their fears passed away now they tiptoed out through the broken weather boarding and stopped at a little distance to exchange a parting word that long lugubrious howl rose on the night air again they turned and saw the strange dog standing within a few feet of where potter was lying and facing potter with his nose pointing heavenward oh, oh jiminy it's him. it's him exclaimed both boys in a breath say tom they say a stray dog come howling round johnny miller's house bout midnight as much as two weeks ago and a whippoorwill came in and lit on the banisters and sung the very same evening and there ain't anybody dead there yet well i know that i suppose there ain't didn't gracie miller fall in the kitchen fire and burn herself terrible the very next saturday yes but she ain't dead and what's more she's getting better too all right you wait and see she's a goner just as dead sure as muff potter's a goner that's what the niggers say and they know all about these kind of things huck then they separated cogitating when tom crept in at his bedroom window the night was almost spent he undressed with excessive caution and fell asleep congratulating himself that nobody knew of his escapade he was not aware that the gently snoring sid was awake and had been so for an hour when tom awoke sid was dressed and gone there was a late look in the light a late sense in the atmosphere he was startled why had he not been called persecuted till he was up as usual the thought filled him with bodings within five minutes he was dressed and downstairs feeling sore and drowsy the family were still at the table but they had finished breakfast there was no voice of rebuke but there were averted eyes there was a silence and an air of solemnity that struck a chill to the culprit's heart he sat down and tried to seem gay but it was uphill work it roused no smile no response and he lapsed into silence and let his heart sink down to the depths after breakfast his aunt took him aside and tom almost brightened in the hope that he was going to be flogged but it was not so his aunt wept over him and asked him how he could go and break her old heart so and finally told him to go on and ruin himself and bring her gray hairs with sorrow to the grave for it was no use for her to try any more this was worse than a thousand whippings and tom's heart was sorer now than his body he cried he pleaded for forgiveness promised to reform over and over again and then received his dismissal feeling that he had won but an imperfect forgiveness and established but a feeble confidence he left the presence too miserable to even feel revengeful towards sid and so the latter's prompt retreat through the back gate was unnecessary he moped to school gloomy and sad and took his flogging along with joe harper for playing hooky the day before with the air of one whose heart was busy with heavier woes and wholly dead to trifles then he betook himself to his seat rested his elbows on his desk and his jaws in his hands and stared at the wall with the stony stare of suffering that has reached the limit and can no further go his elbow was pressing against some hard substance after a long time 
he slowly and sadly changed his position and took up this object with a sigh it was in a paper he unrolled it a long lingering colossal sigh followed and his heart broke it was his brass and iron knob this final feather broke the camel's back End of chapter ten chapter eleven of the adventures of tom sawyer by mark twain this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org chapter eleven muff potter comes to himself tom's conscience at work close upon the hour of noon the whole village was suddenly electrified with the ghastly news no need of the as yet undreamed of telegraph the tale flew from man to man from group to group from house to house with little less than telegraphic speed of course the schoolmaster gave holiday for that afternoon the town would have thought strangely of him if he had not a gory knife had been found close to the murdered man and it had been recognized by somebody as belonging to muff potter so the story ran and it was said that a belated citizen had come upon potter washing himself in the branch about one or two o'clock in the morning and that potter had at once sneaked off suspicious circumstances especially the washing which was not a habit with potter it was also said that the town had been ransacked for this murderer the public are not slow in the matter of sifting evidence and arriving at a verdict but that he could not be found horsemen had departed down all the roads in every direction and the sheriff was confident that he would be captured before night all the town was drifting toward the graveyard tom's heartbreak vanished and he joined the procession not because he would not a thousand times rather go anywhere else but because an awful unaccountable fascination drew him on arrived at the dreadful place he wormed his small body through the crowd and saw the dismal spectacle it seemed to him an age since he was there before somebody pinched his arm he turned his eyes met huckleberries then both looked elsewhere at once and wondered if anybody had noticed anything in their mutual glance but everybody was talking and intent upon the grisly spectacle before them poor fellow poor young fellow this ought to be a lesson to grave robbers muff potter'll hang for this if they catch him this was the drift of remark and the minister said it was a judgment his hand is here now tom shivered from head to heel for his eye fell upon the stolid face of injun joe at this moment the crowd began to sway and struggle and voices shouted it's him it's him he's coming himself who 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 who, who? who? from twenty voices muff potter hello he's stopped look out he's turning don't let him get away people in the branches of the trees over tom's head said he wasn't trying to get away he only looked doubtful and perplexed infernal impudence said a bystander wanted to come and take a quiet look at his work i reckon didn't expect any company the crowd fell apart now and the sheriff came through ostentatiously leading potter by the arm the poor fellow's face was haggard and his eyes showed the fear that was upon him when he stood before the murdered man he shook as with a palsy and he put his face in his hands and burst into tears i didn't do it friends he sobbed pon my word and honor i never done it who's accused you shouted a voice this shot seemed to carry home potter lifted his face and looked around him with a pathetic hopelessness in his eyes he saw injun joe and exclaimed oh injun joe you promised me you'd never is that your knife 
and it was thrust before him by the sheriff. Potter would have fallen if they had not caught him and eased him to the ground. Then he said, Something told me if I didn't come back and get— He shuddered, then waved his nerveless hand with a vanquished gesture and said, Tell him, Joe, tell him. It ain't any use any more. Then Huckleberry and Tom stood dumb and staring, and heard the stony-hearted liar reel off his serene statement, they expecting every moment that the clear sky would deliver God's lightnings upon his head, and wondering to see how long the stroke was delayed. But when he had finished, and still stood alive and whole, their wavering impulse to break their oath and save the poor betrayed prisoner's life faded and vanished away for plainly this miscreant had sold himself to Satan, and it would be fatal to meddle with the property of such a power as that. "'Why didn't you leave? What did you want to come here for?' somebody said. "'I couldn't help it. I couldn't help it,' Potter moaned. "'I wanted to run away, but I couldn't seem to come anywhere but here.' And he fell to sobbing again. Injun Joe repeated his statement just as calmly a few minutes afterward on the inquest, under oath, and the boys, seeing that the lightnings were still withheld, were confirmed in their belief that Joe had sold himself to the devil. He was now become, to them, the most balefully interesting object they had ever looked upon, and they could not take their fascinated eyes from his face. They inwardly resolved to watch him nights when opportunity should offer, in the hope of getting a glimpse of his dread master. Injun Joe helped to raise the body of the murdered man and put it in a wagon for removal, and it was whispered through the shuddering crowd that the wound bled a little. The boys thought that this happy circumstance would turn suspicion in the right direction, but they were disappointed, for more than one villager remarked, it was within three feet of Muff Potter when it done it. Tom's fearful secret and gnawing conscience disturbed his sleep for as much as a week after this, and at breakfast one morning Sid said, Tom, you pitch around and talk in your sleep so much that you keep me awake half the time. Tom blanched and dropped his eyes. It's a bad sign, said Aunt Polly gravely. What you got on your mind, Tom? nothing nothing i know of but the boy's hand shook so that he spilled his coffee and you do talk such stuff sid said last night you said it's blood it's blood that's what it is you said that over and over and you said don't torment me so i'll tell tell what what is it you'll tell everything was swimming before tom there is no telling what might have happened now, but luckily the concern passed out of Aunt Polly's face, and she came to Tom's relief without knowing it. She said, "'Sho, it's that dreadful murder. I dream about it most every night myself. Sometimes I dream it's me that done it.' Mary said she had been affected much the same way. Sid seemed satisfied. Tom got out of the presence as quickly as he plausibly could and after that he complained of toothache for a week, and tied up his jaws every night. He never knew that Sid lay nightly watching, and frequently slipped the bandage free, and then leaned on his elbow, listening a good while at a time, and afterward slipped the bandage back to its place again. Tom's distress of mind wore off gradually, and the toothache grew irksome and was discarded. If Sid really managed to make anything out of Tom's disjointed mutterings, he kept it to himself. It seemed to Tom that his schoolmates never would get done holding inquests on dead cats, and thus keeping his trouble present to his mind. Sid noticed that Tom never was a coroner at one of these inquiries, though it had been his habit to take the lead in all new enterprises. He noticed, too, that Tom never acted as a witness, and that was strange. And Sid did not overlook the fact that Tom even showed a marked aversion to these inquests, and always avoided them when he could. Sid marveled, but said nothing. 
However, even inquests went out of vogue at last, and ceased to torture Tom's conscience. Every day or two during this time of sorrow Tom watched his opportunity, and went to the little grated jail window, and smuggled such small comforts through to the murderer as he could get hold of. The jail was a trifling little brick den that stood in a marsh at the edge of the village, and no guards were afforded for it. Indeed, it was seldom occupied. These offerings greatly helped to ease Tom's conscience. The villagers had a strong desire to tar and feather Injun Joe and ride him on a rail for body-snatching, but so formidable was his character that nobody could be found who was willing to take the lead in the matter, so it was dropped. He had been careful to begin both of his inquest statements with the fight, without confessing the grave robbery that preceded it. Therefore it was deemed wisest not to try the case in the courts at present. End of chapter 11《Chapter Twelve of the Adventures of Tom Sawyer by Mark Twain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Twelve Tom Shows His Generosity, Aunt Polly Weakens. One of the reasons why Tom's mind had drifted away from its secret troubles was that it had found a new and weighty matter to interest itself about. Becky Thatcher had stopped coming to school. Tom had struggled with his pride a few days and tried to whistle her down the wind, but failed. He began to find himself hanging around her father's house nights and feeling very miserable. She was ill what if she should die there was distraction in the thought he no longer took an interest in war not even in piracy the charm of life was gone there was nothing but dreariness left he put his hoop away and his bat there was no joy in them any more his aunt was concerned she began to try all manner of remedies on him she was one of those people who are infatuated with patent medicines and all new-fangled methods of producing health or mending it. She was an inveterate experimenter in these things. When something fresh in this line came out, she was in a fever right away to try it, not on herself, for she was never ailing, but on anybody else that came handy. She was a subscriber for all the health periodicals and phrenological frauds, and the solemn ignorance they were inflated with was breath to her nostrils. All the rot they contained about ventilation, and how to go to bed, and how to get up, and what to eat, and what to drink, and how much exercise to take, and what frame of mind to keep oneself in, and what sort of clothing to wear, was all gospel to her and she never observed that her health journals of the current month customarily upset everything they had recommended the month before. She was as simple-hearted and honest as the day was long, and so she was an easy victim. She gathered together her quack periodicals and her quack medicines, and, thus armed with death, went about on her pale horse, metaphorically speaking, with hell following after but she never suspected that she was not an angel of healing and the balm of gilead in disguise to the suffering neighbors the water treatment was new now and tom's low condition was a windfall to her she had him out at daylight every morning stood him up in the woodshed and drowned him with a deluge of cold water then she scrubbed him down with a towel like a file and so brought him to then she rolled him up in a wet sheet and put him away under blankets till she sweated his soul clean and the yellow stains of it came through his pores as tom said yet notwithstanding all this the boy grew more and more melancholy and pale and dejected she added hot baths sitz baths shower baths and plunges the boy remained as dismal as a hearse 
she began to assist the water with a slim oatmeal diet and blister plasters she calculated his capacity as she would a jugs and filled him up every day with quack cure-alls tom had become indifferent to persecution by this time this phase filled the old lady's heart with consternation this indifference must be broken up at any cost now she heard of painkiller for the first time she ordered a lot at once she tasted it and was filled with gratitude it was simply fire in a liquid form she dropped the water treatment and everything else and pinned her faith to painkiller she gave tom a teaspoonful and watched with the deepest anxiety for the result her troubles were instantly at rest her soul at peace again for the indifference was broken up the boy could not have shown a wilder heartier interest if she had built a fire under him tom felt that it was time to wake up this sort of life might be romantic enough in his blighted condition but it was getting to have too little sentiment and too much distracting variety about it so he thought over various plans for relief finally hit upon that of professing to be fond of painkiller he asked for it so often that he became a nuisance and his aunt ended by telling him to help himself and quit bothering her if it had been sid she would have had no misgivings to alloy her delight but since it was tom she watched the bottle clandestinely she found that the medicine did really diminish but it did not occur to her that the boy was mending the health of a crack in the sitting-room floor with it one day tom was in the act of dosing the crack when his aunt's yellow cat came along purring eyeing the teaspoon avariciously and begging for a taste tom said don't ask for it unless you want it peter but peter signified that he did want it you better make sure peter was sure now you've asked for it and i'll give it to you because there ain't anything mean about me but if you find you don't like it you mustn't blame anybody but your own self peter was agreeable so tom pried his mouth open and poured down the painkiller peter sprang a couple of yards in the air and then delivered a war-hoop and set off round and round the room banging against furniture upsending flower-pots and making general havoc next he rose on his hind feet and pranced around in a frenzy of enjoyment with his head over his shoulder and his voice proclaiming his unappeasable happiness then he went tearing around the house again spreading chaos and destruction in his path and polly entered in time to see him throw a few double somersets deliver a final mighty hurrah and sail through the open window carrying the rest of the flower-pots with him the old lady stood petrified with astonishment peering over her glasses tom lay on the floor expiring with laughter tom what on earth ails that cat i don't know aunt gasped the boy why i never see anything like it what did make him act so i don't know aunt polly cats always act so when they're having a good time they do do they there was something in the tone that made tom apprehensive yes m that is i believe they do you do yes m the old lady was bending down tom watching with interest emphasized by anxiety too late he divined her drift the handle of the tell-tale teaspoon was visible under the bed valance aunt polly took it held it up tom winced and dropped his eyes aunt polly raised him by the usual handle his ear and cracked his head soundly with her thimble now sir what did you want to treat that poor dumb beast so for i done it out of pity for him because he hadn't any aunt hadn't any aunt you numbskull what has that got to do with it heaps because if he'd had one she'd have murked him out herself she'd have roasted his bowels out of him without any more feeling than if he was a human aunt polly felt a sudden pang of remorse this was putting the thing in a new light what was cruelty to a cat might be cruelty to a boy too she began to soften 
she felt sorry her eyes watered a little and she put her hand on tom's head and said gently i was meaning for the best tom and tom it did do you good tom looked up in her face with just a perceptible twinkle peeping through his gravity i know you was meaning it for the best auntie and so was i with peter it done him good too i never see him get round so since oh go long with you tom before you aggravate me again and you try and see if you can't be a good boy for once and you needn't take any more medicine tom reached school ahead of time it was noticed that this strange thing had been occurring every day latterly and now as usual of late he hung about the gate of the schoolyard instead of playing with his comrades he was sick he said and he looked it he tried to seem to be looking everywhere but whither he really was looking down the road presently jeff thatcher hove in sight and tom's face lighted he gazed a moment and then turned sorrowfully away when jeff arrived tom accosted him and led up warily to opportunities for remark about becky but the giddy lad never could see the bait tom watched and watched hoping whenever a frisking frock came in sight and hating the owner of it as soon as he saw she was not the right one at last frocks ceased to appear and he dropped hopelessly into the dumps he entered the empty schoolhouse and sat down to suffer then one more frock passed in at the gate and tom's heart gave a great bound the next instant he was out and going on like an indian yelling laughing chasing boys jumping over the fence at risk of life and limb throwing handsprings standing on his head doing all the heroic things he could conceive of and keeping a furtive eye out all the while to see if becky thatcher was noticing but she seemed to be unconscious of it all she never looked could it be possible that she was not aware that he was there he carried his exploits to her immediate vicinity came war whooping around snatching a boy's cap hurled it to the roof of the schoolhouse broke through a group of boys tumbling them in every direction and fell sprawling himself under becky's nose almost upsetting her and she turned with her nose in the air and he heard her say hm. some people think they're mighty smart always showing off tom's cheeks burned he gathered himself up and sneaked off crushed and crestfallen end of chapter twelve Chapter Thirteen of the Adventures of Tom Sawyer by Mark Twain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Thirteen: The Young Pirates Going to the Rendezvous, The Campfire, Fire Talk. Tom's mind was made up now he was gloomy and desperate he was a forsaken friendless boy he said nobody loved him when they found out what they had driven him to perhaps they would be sorry he had tried to do right and get along but they would not let him since nothing would do them but to get rid of him let it be so and let them blame him for the consequences why shouldn't they what right had the friendless to complain yes they had forced him to it at last he would lead a life of crime there was no choice by this time he was far down meadow lane and the bell for school to take up tinkled faintly upon his ear he sobbed now to think he should never never hear that old familiar sound any more it was very hard but it was forced on him since he was driven out into the cold world he must submit but he forgave them then the sobs came thick and fast just at this point he met his soul's sworn comrade joe harper hard-eyed and with evidently a great and dismal purpose in his heart plainly here were two souls with but a single thought tom wiping his eyes with his sleeve 
began to blubber out something about a resolution to escape from hard usage and lack of sympathy at home by roaming abroad into the great world never to return and ended by hoping that joe would not forget him but it transpired that this was a request which joe had just been going to make of tom and had come to hunt him up for that purpose his mother had whipped him for drinking some cream which he had never tasted and knew nothing about it was plain that she was tired of him and wished him to go if she felt that way there was nothing for him to do but succumb he hoped she would be happy and never regret having driven her poor boy out into the unfeeling world to suffer and die as the two boys walked sorrowing along they made a new compact to stand by each other and be brothers and never separate till death relieved them of their troubles then they began to lay their plans joe was for being a hermit and living on crusts in a remote cave and dying some time of cold and want and grief but after listening to tom he conceded that there were some conspicuous advantages about a life of crime and so he consented to be a pirate three miles below st petersburg at a point where the mississippi river was a trifle over a mile wide there was a long narrow wooded island with a shallow bar at the head of it and this offered well as a rendezvous it was not inhabited it lay far over toward the further shore abreast a dense and almost wholly unpeopled forest so jackson's island was chosen who were to be the subjects of their piracies was a matter that did not occur to them then they hunted up huckleberry finn and he joined them promptly for all careers were one to him he was indifferent they presently separated to meet at a lonely spot on the river bank two miles above the village at the favorite hour which was midnight there was a small log raft there which they meant to capture each would bring hooks and lines and such provision as he could steal in the most dark and mysterious way as became outlaws and before the afternoon was done they had all managed to enjoy the sweet glory of spreading the fact that pretty soon the town would hear something all who got this vague hint were cautioned to be more white about midnight tom arrived with a boiled ham and a few trifles and stopped in a dense undergrowth on a small bluff overlooking the meeting place it was starlight and very still the mighty river lay like an ocean at rest tom listened a moment but no sound disturbed the quiet then he gave a low distinct whistle it was answered from under the bluff tom whistled twice more these signals were answered in the same way then a guarded voice said who goes there tom sawyer the black avenger of the spanish main name your name huck finn the red-handed and joe harper the terror of the seas tom had furnished these titles from his favorite literature tis well give the countersign two hoarse whispers delivered the same awful word simultaneously to the brooding night blood then tom tumbled his ham over the bluff and let himself down after it tearing both skin and clothes to some extent in the effort there was an easy comfortable path along the shore under the bluff but it lacked the advantages of difficulty and danger so valued by a pirate the terror of the seas had brought a side of bacon and had about worn himself out with getting it there finn the red-handed had stolen a skillet and a quantity of half-cured leaf tobacco and had also brought a few corn cobs to make pipes with but none of the pirates smoked or chewed but himself the black avenger of the spanish main said it would never do to start without some fire that was a wise thought matches were hardly known there in that day they saw a fire smouldering upon a great raft a hundred yards above and they went stealthily thither and helped themselves to a chunk they made an imposing adventure of it saying hist every now and then and suddenly halting with finger on lip 
moving with hands on imaginary dagger hilts and giving orders in dismal whispers that if the foe stirred let him have it to the hill because dead men tell no tales they knew well enough that the raftsmen were all down at the village laying in stores or having a spree but still that was no excuse for their conducting this thing in an unpiratical way they shoved off presently tom in command huck at the after oar and joe at the forward tom stood amidships gloomy browed and with folded arms and gave his orders in a low stern whisper Look, and bring her to the wind aye aye sir steady 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 it is sir let her go off a point point it is sir as the boys steadily and monotonously drove the raft toward midstream it was no doubt understood that these orders were given only for style and were not intended to mean anything in particular what sails you carrying courses topsails and flying jibs sir send the riles up lay out a lot there half a dozen of you four top mast and full lively now aye aye sir check out that main gallon full sheet and braces now my hearties aye aye sir helen marie hard at port stand by to meet her when she comes port port now then with a will steady steady it is sir the raft drew beyond the middle of the river the boys pointed her head right and then lay on their oars the river was not high so there was not more than a two or three mile current hardly a word was said during the next three-quarters of an hour now the raft was passing before the distant town two or three glimmering lights showed where it lay peacefully sleeping beyond the vague vast sweep of star-gemmed water unconscious of the tremendous event that was happening the black avenger stood still with folded arms looking his last upon the scene of his former joys and his later sufferings and wishing she could see him now abroad on the wild sea facing peril and death with dauntless heart going to his doom with a grim smile on his lips it was but a small strain on his imagination to remove jackson's island beyond eyeshot of the village and so he looked his last with a broken and satisfied heart the other pirates were looking their last too and they all looked so long that they came near letting the current drift them out of the range of the island but they discovered the danger in time and made shift to avert it about two o'clock in the morning the raft grounded on the bar two hundred yards above the head of the island and they waded back and forth until they landed their freight part of the little raft's belongings consisted of an old sail and this they spread over a nook in the bushes for a tent to shelter their provisions but they themselves would sleep in the open air in good weather as became outlaws they built a fire against the side of a great log twenty or thirty steps within the sombre depths of the forest and then cooked some bacon in the frying pan for supper and used up half the corn pone stock they had brought it seemed glorious sport to be feasting in that wild free way in the virgin forest of an unexplored and uninhabited island far from the haunts of men and they said they never would return to civilization the climbing fire lit up their faces and threw its ruddy glare upon the pillared tree trunks of their forest temple and upon the varnished foliage and festooning vines when the last crisp slice of bacon was gone and the last allowance of corn pone devoured the boys stretched themselves out on the grass filled with contentment they could have found a cooler place but they would not deny themselves such a romantic feature as the roasting campfire and it gay said joe it's nuts said tom what would the boys say if they could see us say well they just die to be here hey hucky i reckon so said huckleberry anyways i'm suited i don't want nothin better than this i don't ever get enough to eat gentlely 
and here they can't come and pick at a feller and bullyrag him so it's just a lie for me said tom you don't have to get up mornings and you don't have to go to school with wash and all that blame foolishness you see a pirate don't have to do anything joe when he's ashore but a hermit he has to be praying considerable and then he don't have any fun anyway all by himself that way oh yes that's so said joe but i hadn't thought much about it you know and a good deal rather be a pirate now that i've tried it you see said tom people don't go much on hermits nowadays like they used to in old times but a pirate's always respected and a hermit's got to sleep in the hardest place he can find and put sackcloth and ashes on his head and stand out in the rain and what does he put sackcloth and ashes on his head for inquired huck i don't know but they gotta do it hermits always do you'd have to do that if you was a hermit Turned if i would said huck well what would you do i don't know but i wouldn't do that why huck you'd have to how'd you get around it why i just wouldn't stand it i'd run away run away well you would be a nice slouch of a hermit you'd be a disgrace the red-handed made no response being better employed he had finished gouging out a cob and now he fitted a weed stem to it loaded it with tobacco and was pressing a coal to the charge and blowing a cloud of fragrant smoke he was in the full bloom of luxurious contentment the other pirates envied him his majestic vice and secretly resolved to acquire it shortly presently huck said what does pirates have to do tom said oh they have just a bully time take ships and burn em and get the money and bury it in awful places in their islands where there's ghosts and things to watch it and kill everybody in the ship make em walk a plank and they carry the women to the island said joe they don't kill the women no assented tom they don't kill the women they're too noble and the women's always beautiful too and don't they wear the bulliest clothes oh no all gold and silver and diamonds said joe with enthusiasm who said huck why the pirates huck scanned his own clothing forlornly i reckon i ain't dressed fitten for a pirate said he with a regretful pathos in his voice but i ain't got none but these but the other boys told him the fine clothes would come fast enough after they should have begun their adventures they made him understand that his poor rags would do to begin with though it was customary for wealthy pirates to start with a proper wardrobe gradually their talk died out and drowsiness began to steal upon the eyelids of the little waifs the pipe dropped from the fingers of the red-handed and he slept the sleep of the conscience free and the weary the terror of the seas and the black avenger of the spanish main had more difficulty in getting to sleep they said their prayers inwardly and lying down since there was nobody there with authority to make them kneel and recite aloud in truth they had a mind not to say them at all but they were afraid to proceed to such lengths as that lest they might call down a sudden and special thunderbolt from heaven then at once they reached and hovered upon the imminent verge of sleep but an intruder came now that would not down it was conscience they began to feel a vague fear that they had been doing wrong to run away the next they thought of the stolen meat and then the real torture came they tried to argue it away by reminding conscience that they had purloined sweetmeats and apples scores of times but conscience was not to be appeased by such thin plausibilities it seemed to them in the end that there was no getting around the stubborn fact that taking sweetmeats was only hooking while taking bacon and hams and such valuables was plain simple stealing and there was a command against that in the bible so they inwardly resolved that so long as they remained in the business their piracies should not again be sullied with the crime of stealing 
then conscience granted a truce and these curiously inconsistent pirates fell peacefully to sleep end of chapter 13 chapter 14 of the adventures of tom sawyer by mark twain this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org chapter 14 camp life a sensation tom steals away from camp when tom awoke in the morning he wondered where he was he sat up and rubbed his eyes and looked around then he comprehended it was a cool gray dawn and there was a delicious sense of repose and peace in the deep pervading calm and silence of the woods not a leaf stirred not a sound obtruded upon great nature's meditation beaded dewdrops stood upon the leaves and grasses a white layer of ashes covered the fire and a thin blue breath of smoke rose straight into the air joe and huck still slept now far away in the woods a bird called another answered presently the hammering of a woodpecker was heard gradually the cool dim gray of morning whitened and as gradually sounds multiplied and life manifested itself the marvel of nature shaking off sleep and going to work unfolded itself to the musing boy a little green worm came crawling over a dewy leaf lifting two-thirds of his body into the air from time to time and sniffing around then proceeding again for he was measuring tom said and when the worm approached him of its own accord he sat as still as a stone with his hopes rising and falling by turns as the creature still came toward him or seemed inclined to go elsewhere and when at last it considered a painful moment with its curved body in the air and then came decisively down upon tom's leg and began a journey over him his whole heart was glad for that meant he was going to have a new suit of clothes without the shadow of a doubt a gaudy piratical uniform now a procession of ants appeared from nowhere in particular and went about their labors one struggled manfully by with a dead spider five times as big as itself in its arms and lugged it straight up a tree trunk a brown spotted ladybug climbed the dizzy height of a grass blade and tom bent down close to it and said ladybug ladybug fly away home your house is on fire your children's alone and she took wing and went off to see about it which did not surprise the boy for he knew of old that this insect was credulous about conflagrations and he had practised upon its simplicity more than once a tumble-bug came next heaving sturdily at its ball and tom touched the creature to see it shut its legs against its body and pretend to be dead the birds were fairly rioting by this time a catbird the northern mocker lit in a tree over tom's head and trilled out her imitations of her neighbours in a rapture of enjoyment then a shrill jay swept down a flash of blue flame and stopped on a twig almost within the boy's reach cocked his head to one side and eyed the strangers with a consuming curiosity a gray squirrel and a big fellow of the fox kind came scurrying along sitting up at intervals to inspect and chatter at the boys for the wild things had probably never seen a human being before and scarcely knew whether to be afraid or not all nature was wide awake and stirring now long lances of sunlight pierced down through the dense foliage far and near and a few butterflies came fluttering upon the scene tom stirred up the other pirates and they all clattered away with a shout and in a minute or two were stripped and chasing after and tumbling over each other in the shallow limpid water of the white sandbar they felt no longing for the little village sleeping in the distance beyond the majestic waste of water a vagrant current or a slight rise in the river had carried off their raft but this only gratified them since its going was something like burning the bridge between them and civilization 
they came back to camp wonderfully refreshed, glad-hearted, and ravenous, and they soon had the campfire blazing up again. Huck found a spring of clear cold water close by, and the boys made cups of broad oak or hickory leaves, and felt that water, sweetened with such a wildwood charm as that, would be a good enough substitute for coffee. While Joe was slicing bacon for breakfast, Tom and Huck asked him to hold on a minute. They stepped to a promising nook in the river bank and threw in their lines. Almost immediately they had reward. Joe had not had time to get impatient before they were back again with some handsome bass, a couple of sun perch, and a small catfish, provisions enough for quite a family. They fried the fish with the bacon and were astonished for no fish had ever seemed so delicious before. They did not know that the quicker a fresh-water fish is on the fire after he is caught, the better he is, and they reflected little upon what a sauce, open-air sleeping, open-air exercise, bathing, and a large ingredient of hunger make, too. They lay around in the shade after breakfast, while Huck had a smoke, and then went off through the woods on an exploring expedition. They tramped gaily along, over decaying logs, through tangled underbrush, among solemn monarchs of the forest, hung from their crowns to the ground with a drooping regalia of grapevines. Now and then they came upon snug nooks carpeted with grass and jewelled with flowers. They found plenty of things to be delighted with, but nothing to be astonished at. They discovered that the island was about three miles long and a quarter of a mile wide, and that the shore it lay closest to was only separated from it by a narrow channel hardly two hundred yards wide. They took a swim about every hour, so it was close upon the middle of the afternoon when they got back to camp. They were too hungry to stop to fish, but they fared sumptuously upon cold ham, and then threw themselves down in the shade to talk. But the talk soon began to drag, and then died. The stillness, the solemnity that brooded in the woods, and the sense of loneliness began to tell upon the spirits of the boys. They fell to thinking. A sort of undefined longing crept upon them. This took dim shape presently. It was budding homesickness. Even Finn the Red-Handed was dreaming of his doorsteps and empty hogsheads. But they were all ashamed of their weakness and none was brave enough to speak his thought. For some time now the boys had been duly conscious of a peculiar sound at the distance, just as one sometimes is of the ticking of a clock, which he takes no distinct note of. But now this mysterious sound became more pronounced and forced a recognition. The boys started, glanced at each other, and then each assumed a listening attitude. There was a long silence, profound and unbroken. Then a deep, sullen boom came floating down out of the distance. "'What is it?' exclaimed Joe under his breath. "'I wonder,' said Tom in a whisper. "'Tain't thunder,' said Huckleberry in an awed tone. "'Because thunder—' "'Hark!' said Tom. "'Listen, don't talk.' They waited a time that seemed an age and then the same muffled boom troubled the solemn hush. "'Let's go and see.' They sprang to their feet and hurried to the shore toward the town. They parted the bushes on the bank and peered out over the water. The little steam ferryboat was about a mile below the village, drifting with the current. Her broad deck seemed crowded with people. There were a great many skiffs rowing about or floating with the stream in the neighborhood of the ferryboat, but the boys could not determine what the men in them were doing. Presently a great jet of white smoke burst from the ferryboat's side, and as it expanded and rose in a lazy cloud, that same dull throb of sound was borne to the listeners again. "'I know now!' exclaimed Tom. "'Somebody's drowned!' "'That's it!' said Huck. "'They done that last summer, when Bill Turner got drowned. They shoot a cannon over the water, and that makes him come up to the top.' Yes, and they take loaves of bread and put quicksilver in em, and set em afloat, and wherever there's anybody that's drowned, they'll float right there and stop. Yes, I've heard about it, said Joe. I wonder what makes that bread do that. 
Oh, it ain't the bread so much, said Tom. I reckon it's mostly what they say over it before they start it out. But they don't say anything over it, said Huck. I've seen them and they don't. Well, that's funny, said Tom. But maybe they say it to themselves. Of course they do. Anybody might know that. The other boys agree that there was reason in what Tom said, because an ignorant lump of bread, uninstructed by an incantation, could not be expected to act very intelligently when set upon an errand of such gravity. But Jinx, I wish I was over there now, said Joe. I do too, said Huck. I'd give heaps to know who it is. The boys still listened and watched. Presently, a revealing thought flashed through Tom's mind, and he exclaimed, Boys, I know who's drowned. It's us. They felt like heroes in an instant. Here was a gorgeous triumph. They were missed. They were mourned. Hearts were breaking on their account. Tears were being shed. Accusing memories of unkindness to these poor lost lads were rising up and unavailing regrets and remorse were being indulged, and, best of all, the departed were the talk of the whole town and the envy of all the boys as far as this dazzling notoriety was concerned. This was fine. It was worth while to be a pirate, after all. As twilight drew on, the ferryboat went back to her accustomed business and the skiffs disappeared. The pirates returned to camp. They were jubilant with vanity over their new grandeur and the illustrious trouble they were making. They caught fish, cooked supper, and ate it, and then fell to guessing at what the village was thinking and saying about them, and the pictures they drew of the public distress on their account were gratifying to look upon from their point of view. But when the shadows of night closed them in, they gradually ceased to talk and sat gazing into the fire with their minds evidently wandering elsewhere. The excitement was gone now, and Tom and Joe could not keep back thoughts of certain persons at home who were not enjoying this fine frolic as much as they were. Misgivings came. They grew troubled and unhappy. A sigh or two escaped, unawares. By and by, Joe timidly ventured upon a roundabout feeler as to how the others might look upon a return to civilization. Not right now, but... Tom withered him with derision. Huck, being uncommitted as yet, joined in with Tom, and the waverer quickly explained, and was glad to get out of the scrape with as little taint of chicken-hearted homesickness clinging to his garments as he could. Mutiny was effectually laid to rest for the moment. As the night deepened, Huck began to nod, and presently to snore. Joe followed next. Tom lay upon his elbow motionless for some time, watching the two intently. At last he got up cautiously on his knees, and went searching among the grass and the flickering reflections flung by the campfire. He picked up and inspected several large semicylinders of the thin white bark of a sycamore, and finally chose two which seemed to suit him. Then he knelt by the fire and painfully wrote something upon each of these with his red keel. One he rolled up and put in his jacket pocket, and the other he put in Joe's hat and removed it to a little distance from the owner and he also put into that hat certain schoolboy treasures of almost inestimable value, among them a lump of chalk, an india-rubber ball, three fish-hooks, and one of that kind of marbles known as the sure-nuff crystal. Then he tiptoed his way cautiously among the trees till he felt that he was out of hearing, and straightway broke into a keen run in the direction of the sandbar. End of chapter 14「Fifteen of the Adventures of Tom Sawyer by Mark Twain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 15 Tom Reconnoiters learns the situation, reports at camp. 
A few minutes later Tom was in the shoal water of the bar, wading toward the Illinois shore. Before the depth reached his middle he was halfway over. The current would permit no more wading now, so he struck out confidently to swim the remaining hundred yards. He swam quartering upstream, but still was swept downward rather faster than he had expected. However, he reached the shore finally, and drifted along till he found a low place and drew himself out. He put his hand on his jacket pocket, finding his piece of bark safe, and then struck through the woods, following the shore with streaming garments. Shortly before ten o'clock he came out into an open place opposite the village, and saw the ferry-boat lying in the shadow of the trees and the high bank. Everything was quiet under the blinking stars. He crept down the bank, watching with all his eyes, slipped into the water, swam three or four strokes, and climbed into the skiff that did yawl duty at the boat's stern. He laid himself down under the thwarts and waited, panting. Presently the cracked bell tapped, and a voice gave the order to cast off. A moment or two later the skiff's head was standing high up against the boat's swell, and the voyage was begun. Tom felt happy in his success, for he knew it was the boat's last trip for the night. At the end of a long twelve or fifteen minutes the wheels stopped, and Tom slipped overboard and swam ashore in the dusk, landing fifty yards downstream, out of danger of possible stragglers. He flew along unfrequented alleys, and shortly found himself at his aunt's back fence. He climbed over, approached the L, and looked in at the sitting-room window, for a light was burning there. There sat Aunt Polly, Sid, Mary, and Joe Harper's mother, grouped together, talking. They were by the bed, and the bed was between them and the door. Tom went to the door and began to softly lift the latch. Then he pressed gently, and the door yielded a crack. He continued pushing cautiously and quaking every time it creaked, till he judged he might squeeze through on his knees. So he put his head through and began warily. "'What makes the candle blow so?' said Aunt Polly. Tom hurried up. "'Why, that door's open, I believe. Why, of course it is. No end of strange things now. Go along and shut it, Sid.' Tom disappeared under the bed just in time. He lay and breathed himself for a time, and then crept to where he could almost touch his aunt's foot. "'But as I was saying,' said Aunt Polly, "'he weren't bad, so to say, only mischievous, only just giddy and harem scarum, you know. He weren't any more responsible than a colt. He never meant any harm, and he was the best-hearted boy that ever was.' And she began to cry. "'It was just so with my Joe always full of his devilment, and up to every kind of mischief, but he was just as unselfish and kind as he could be. And laws bless me, to think I went and whipped him for taking that cream, never once recollecting that I throwed it out myself because it was sour, and I never to see him again in this world, never, 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 poor abused boy. And Mrs. Harper sobbed, as if her heart would break. I hope Tom's better off where he is, said Sid. But if he'd been better, in some ways... Sid! Tom felt the glare of the old lady's eye, though he could not see it. Not a word against my Tom now that he's gone. God'll take care of him. Never you trouble yourself, sir. Oh, Mrs. Harper, I don't know how to give him up. I don't know how to give him up. He was such a comfort to me, although he tormented my old heart out of me most. The Lord giveth, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. But it's so hard. Oh, it's so hard. Only last Saturday my Joe busted a firecracker right under my nose, and I knocked him sprawling. Little did I know then how soon. Oh, if it was to do over again, I'd hug him and bless him for it. Yes, 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 I know just how you feel, Mrs. Harper. I know just exactly how you feel. No longer ago than yesterday noon my Tom took and filled the cat full of painkiller, and I did think the critter would tear the house down. And God forgive me, I cracked Tom's head with my thimble, poor boy. 
poor dead boy. But he's out of all his troubles now. And the last words I ever heard him say was to reproach. But this memory was too much for the old lady, and she broke entirely down. Tom was snuffling now himself, and more in pity of himself than anybody else. He could hear Mary crying and putting in a kindly word for him from time to time. He began to have a nobler opinion of himself than ever before. Still, he was sufficiently touched by his aunt's grief to long to rush out from under the bed and overwhelm her with joy, and the theatrical gorgeousness of the thing appealed strongly to his nature, too, but he resisted and lay still. He went on listening, and gathering, by odds and ends, that it was conjectured at first that the boys had got drowned while taking a swim. Then the small raft had been missed. Next, certain boys said the missing lads had promised that the village should hear something soon. The wise heads had put this and that together, and decided that the boys had gone off on that raft and would turn up at the next town below presently. But toward noon the raft had been found, lodged against the Missouri shore some five or six miles below the village, and then hope perished. They must be drowned, else hunger would have driven them home by nightfall, if not sooner. It was believed that the search for the bodies had been a fruitless effort merely because the drowning must have occurred in mid-channel, since the boys, being good swimmers, would otherwise have escaped to shore. This was Wednesday night. If the bodies continued missing until Sunday, all hope would be given over, and the funerals would be preached on that morning. Tom shuddered. Mrs. Harper gave a sobbing good night and turned to go. Then, with a mutual impulse, the two bereaved women flung themselves into each other's arms and had a good consoling cry, and then parted. Aunt Polly was tender far beyond her wont in her good night to Sid and Mary. Sid snuffled a bit, and Mary went off crying with all her heart. Aunt Polly knelt down and prayed for Tom so touchingly, so appealingly, and with such measureless love in her words and her old trembling voice, that he was weltering in tears again, long before she was through. He had to keep still long after she went to bed, for she kept making broken-hearted ejaculations from time to time, tossing unrestfully, and turning over. But at last she was still, only moaning a little in her sleep. Now the boy stole out, rose gradually by the bedside, shaded the candlelight with his hand, and stood regarding her. His heart was full of pity for her. He took out his sycamore scroll and placed it by the candle. But something occurred to him, and he lingered, considering. His face lighted with a happy solution of his thought. He put the bark hastily in his pocket. Then he bent over and kissed the faded lips, and straightway made his stealthy exit, latching the door behind him. He threaded his way back to the ferry landing, found nobody at large there, and walked boldly on board the boat, for he knew she was tenantless, except that there was a watchman, who always turned in and slept like a graven image. He untied the skiff at the stern, slipped into it, and was soon rowing consciously upstream. When he had pulled a mile above the village, he started quartering across and bent himself stoutly to his work. He hit the landing on the other side neatly, for this was a familiar bit of work to him. He was moved to capture the skiff, arguing that it might be considered a ship, and therefore legitimate prey for a pirate but he knew a thorough search would be made for it, and that might end in revelations. So he stepped ashore and entered the woods. He sat down and took a long rest, torturing himself meanwhile to keep awake, and then started warily down the home stretch. The night was far spent. It was broad daylight before he found himself fairly abreast the island bar. He rested again until the sun was well up and gilding the great river with its splendor, and then he plunged into the stream. A little later he paused, dripping, upon the threshold of the camp, and heard Joe say, No, 
Tom's true blue hug, and he'll come back. He won't desert. He knows that would be a disgrace to a pirate, and Tom's too proud for that sort of thing. He's up to something or other. Now I wonder what? Well, the things is ours anyway, ain't they? Pretty near, but not yet, Huck. The writing says they are if he ain't back here to breakfast. Which he is? exclaimed Tom, with a fine dramatic effect, stepping grandly into camp. A sumptuous breakfast of bacon and fish was shortly provided, and as the boys set to work upon it, Tom recounted and adorned his adventures. They were a vain and boastful company of heroes when the tale was done. Then Tom hid himself away in a shady nook to sleep till noon, and the other pirates got ready to fish and explore. End of chapter 15「Chapter Sixteen of the Adventures of Tom Sawyer by Mark Twain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Sixteen A Day's Amusements Tom Reveals a Secret. The Pirates Take a Lesson. A Night Surprise. An Indian War. After dinner, all the gang turned out to hunt for turtle eggs on the bar. They went about poking sticks into the sand, and when they found a soft place, they went down on their knees and dug with their hands. Sometimes they would take fifty or sixty eggs out of one hole. They were perfectly round white things, a trifle smaller than an English walnut. They had a famous fried egg feast that night, and another on Friday morning. After breakfast they went whooping and prancing out on the bar, and chased each other round and round, shedding clothes as they went until they were naked, and then continued the frolic far away up the shoal water of the bar, against the stiff current, which latter tripped their legs from under them from time to time, and greatly increased the fun and now and then they stopped in a group and splashed water in each other's faces with their palms, gradually approaching each other with averted faces to avoid the strangling sprays, and finally gripping and struggling till the best man ducked his neighbor, and then they all went under in a tangle of white legs and arms, and came up blowing, sputtering, laughing, and gasping for breath at one and the same time. When they were well exhausted, they would run out and sprawl on the dry hot sand, and lie there, and cover themselves up with it, and by and by break for the water again, and go through the original performance once more. Finally, it occurred to them that their naked skin represented flesh-colored tights very fairly, so they drew a ring in the sand, and had a circus, with three clowns in it, for none would yield this proudest post to his neighbor. Next they got their marbles and played knucks and ring-taw and keeps till that amusement grew stale. Then Joe and Huck had another swim, but Tom would not venture, because he found that in kicking off his trousers he had kicked his string of rattlesnake rattles off his ankle, and he wondered how he had escaped cramp so long without the protection of this mysterious charm. He did not venture again until he had found it and by that time the other boys were tired and ready to rest. They gradually wandered apart, dropped into the dumps, and fell to gazing longingly across the wide river to where the village lay drowsing in the sun. Tom found himself writing Becky in the sand with his big toe. He scratched it out and was angry with himself for his weakness. But he wrote it again, nevertheless. He could not help it. He erased it once more, and then took himself out of temptation by driving the other boys together and joining them. But Joe's spirits had gone down almost beyond resurrection. He was so homesick that he could hardly endure the misery of it. The tears lay very near the surface. Huck was melancholy, too. Tom was downhearted, but tried hard not to show it. He had a secret which he was not ready to tell yet 
but if this mutinous depression was not broken up soon, he would have to bring it out. He said, with a great show of cheerfulness, I bet there's been pirates on this island before, boys. So let's explore it again. They've hid treasures here somewhere. How'd you feel to light on a rotten chest full of gold and silver, hey? But it roused only faint enthusiasm, which faded out with no reply. Tom tried one or two other seductions, but they failed too. It was discouraging work. Joe sat poking up the sand with a stick and looking very gloomy. Finally, he said, Oh, boys, let's give up. I want to go home. It's so lonesome. Oh, no, Joe. You'll feel better by and by, said Tom. Just think of the fishing that's here. I don't care for fishing. I want to go home. But, Joe, there ain't another such swimming place anywhere. Swimming's no good. I don't seem to care for it somehow, when there ain't anybody to say I shan't go in. I mean to go home. Oh, shucks, baby. You want to see your mother, I reckon. Yes, I do want to see my mom. And you would, too, if you had one. I ain't any more baby than you are. <laughs> and Joe snuffled a little. Well, we'll let the crybaby go home to his mother, won't we, Huck? Poor thing. Does he want to see its mother? And so it shall. You like it here, don't you, Huck? We'll stay, won't we? Huck said, Yes. Without any heart in it. I'll never speak to you again as long as I live, said Joe, rising. There now. And he moved moodily away and began to dress himself. Who cares? said Tom. Nobody wants you to. Go along home and get laughed at. Oh, you're a nice pirate. Huck and me ain't crybabies. We'll stay here, won't we, Huck? Let him go if he wants to. I reckon we can get along without him, perhaps. But Tom was uneasy nevertheless, and was alarmed to see Joe go sullenly on with his dressing. And then it was discomforting to see Huck eyeing Joe's preparation so wistfully and keeping up such an ominous silence. Presently, without a parting word, Joe began to wade off toward the Illinois shore. Tom's heart began to sink. He glanced at Huck. Huck could not bear the look and dropped his eyes. Then he said, I want to go too, Tom. It was getting so lonesome anyway, and now it'll be worse. Let's us go too, Tom. I won't. You can all go if you want to. I mean to stay. Tom, I better go. Well, go long. Who's hindering you? Huck began to pick up his scattered clothes. He said, Tom, I wished you'd come too. Now you think it over. We'll wait for you when we get to shore. Well, you'll wait a blame long time, that's all. Huck started sorrowfully away, and Tom stood looking after him with a strong desire tugging at his heart to yield his pride and go along too. He hoped the boys would stop, but they still waited slowly on. It suddenly dawned on Tom that it was become very lonely and still. He made one final struggle with his pride, and then darted after his comrades, yelling, Wait, wait, I want to tell you something. They presently stopped and turned around. When he got to where they were, he began unfolding his secret and they listened moodily till at last they saw the point he was driving at. And then they set up a war-whoop of applause, and said it was splendid, and said if he had told them at first, they wouldn't have started away. He made a plausible excuse, but his real reason had been the fear that not even the secret would keep them with him any very great length of time, and so he meant to hold it in reserve as a last seduction. The lads came gaily back and went at their sports again with a will, chattering all the time about Tom's stupendous plan and admiring the genius of it. After a dainty egg and fish dinner, Tom said he wanted to learn to smoke now. Joe caught at the idea and said he would like to try too. So Huck made pipes and filled them. These novices had never smoked anything before but cigars made of grapevine and they bit the tongue, and were not considered manly anyway. 
now they stretched themselves out on their elbows and began to puff charily and with slender confidence the smoke had an unpleasant taste and they gagged a little but tom said why it's just as easy if i'd have known this was all i'd have learnt long ago so would i said joe it's just nothing why many a time i've looked at people smoking and thought well i wish i could do that but i never thought i could said tom that's just the way with me ain't it huck you've heard me talk just that way haven't you huck i leave it to huck if i haven't yes heaps of times said huck well i have too said tom oh hundreds of times once down by the slaughterhouse don't you remember huck bob tanner was there johnny miller and jeff thatcher when i said it don't you remember huck about me saying that yes that's so said huck that was the day after i lost a white alley no twas the day before there i told you so said tom huck recollects it i believe i could smoke this pipe all day said joe i don't feel sick neither do i said tom i could smoke it all day but i bet you jeff thatcher couldn't jeff thatcher why he'd kneel over just with two drawers just let him try it once he'd see i bet he would and johnny miller i wished i could see johnny miller tackle it once oh don't i said joe why i bet you johnny miller couldn't any more do this than nothing just one little snifter would fetch him deed it would joe say i wish the boys could see us now so do i say boy don't say anything about it and sometime when they're around i'll come up to you and say joe got a pipe i want to smoke and you'll say kind of careless like as if it weren't anything you'll say yes i got my old pipe and another one but my tobacco ain't very good and i'll say oh that's all right if it's strong enough and then you'll be out with the pipes and we'll light up just as calm and then just see em look Batchings, that'll be gay tom i wish i was now so do i and when we tell em we learned when we was off piratin won't they wish they'd been along oh i reckon not i just bet they will so the talk ran on but presently it began to flag a trifle and grew disjointed the silences widened the expectoration marvellously increased every pore inside the boys cheeks became a spouting fountain and they could scarcely bail out the cellars under their tongues fast enough to prevent an inundation little overflowings down their throats occurred in spite of all they could do and sudden retchings followed every time both boys were looking very pale and miserable now joe's pipe dropped from his nerveless fingers tom's followed both fountains were going furiously and both pumps bailing with might and main joe said feebly i've lost my knife i reckon i better go and find it tom said with quivering lips and halting utterance i'll help you you go over that way and i'll hunt round by the spring no you you needn't come huck we can find it so huck sat down again and waited an hour then he found it lonesome and went to find his comrades they were wide apart in the woods both very pale both fast asleep but something informed him that if they had had any trouble they had got rid of it they were not talkative at supper that night they had a humble look and when huck prepared his pipe after the meal and was going to prepare theirs they said no they were not feeling very well something they ate at dinner had disagreed with them about midnight joe awoke and called the boys there was a brooding oppressiveness in the air that seemed to bode something the boys huddled themselves together and sought the friendly companionship of the fire though the dull dead heat of the breathless atmosphere was stifling they sat still intent and waiting the solemn hush continued beyond the light of the fire everything was swallowed up in the blackness of darkness presently there came a quivering glow that vaguely revealed the foliage for a moment and then vanished by and by another came a little stronger then another 
Then a faint moan came sighing through the branches of the forest, and the boys felt a fleeting breath upon their cheeks, and shuddered with the fancy that the spirit of the night had gone by. There was a pause. Now a weird flash turned night into day, and showed every little grass-blade, separate and distinct, that grew about their feet. And it showed three white, startled faces, too. A deep peal of thunder went rolling and tumbling down the heavens, and lost itself in sullen rumblings in the distance. A sweep of chilly air passed by, rustling all the leaves and snowing the flaky ashes broadcast about the fire. Another fierce glare lit up the forest, and an instant crash followed that seemed to rend the treetops right over the boys' heads. They clung together in terror in the thick gloom that followed. A few big raindrops fell pattering upon the leaves. "'Quick, boy, go for the tent!' exclaimed Tom. They sprang away, stumbling over roots and among vines in the dark, no two plunging in the same direction. A furious blast roared through the trees, making everything sing as it went. One blinding flash after another came, and peal on peal of deafening thunder. And now a drenching rain poured down, and the rising hurricane drove it in sheets along the ground. The boys cried out to each other, but the roaring wind and the booming thunder blasts drowned their voices utterly. However, one by one they straggled in at last and took shelter under the tent, cold, scared, and streaming with water. But to have company in misery seemed something to be grateful for. They could not talk, the old sail flapped so furiously, even if the other noises would have allowed them. The tempest rose higher and higher, and presently the sail tore loose from its fastenings and went winging away on the blast. The boys seized each other's hands and fled, with many tumblings and bruisings, to the shelter of a great oak that stood upon the river bank. Now the battle was at its highest. Under the ceaseless conflagration of lightning that flamed in the skies, everything below stood out in clean-cut and shadowless distinctness. The bending trees, the billowy river, white with foam, the driving spray of spume flakes, the dim outlines of the high bluffs on the other side glimpsed through the drifting cloud rack and the slanting veil of rain. Every little while some giant tree yielded the fight and fell, crashing through the younger growth. And the unflagging thunder peals came now in ear-splitting explosive blasts, keen and sharp and unspeakably appalling. The storm culminated in one matchless effort that seemed likely to tear the island to pieces, burn it up, drown it to the treetops, blow it away, and deafen every creature in it all at one and the same moment. It was a wild night for homeless young heads to be out in. But at last the battle was done, and the forces retired with weaker and weaker threatenings and grumblings, and peace resumed her sway. The boys went back to camp a good deal awed, but they found there was still something to be thankful for, because the great sycamore, the shelter of their beds was a ruin now, blasted by the lightnings, and they were not under it when the catastrophe happened. Everything in camp was drenched, the campfire as well, for they were but heedless lads like their generation, and had made no provision against rain. Here was a matter for dismay, for they were soaked through and chilled, they were eloquent in their distress, but they presently discovered that the fire had eaten so far up under the great log it had been built against, where it curved upward and separated itself from the ground, that a hand-breadth or so of it had escaped wetting. So they patiently wrought, until, with shreds and bark gathered from the undersides of sheltered logs, they coaxed the fire to burn again. Then they piled on great dead boughs till they had a roaring furnace, and were glad-hearted once more. They dried their boiled ham and had a feast, and after that they sat by the fire and expanded and glorified their midnight adventure until morning, 
for there was not a dry spot to sleep on anywhere around. As the sun began to steal in upon the boys, dreariness came over them, and they went out on the sandbar and lay down to sleep. They got scorched out by and by, and drearily set about getting breakfast. After the meal they felt rusty and stiff-jointed, and a little homesick once more. Tom saw the signs, and fell to cheering up the pirates as well as he could. But they cared nothing for marbles, or circus, or swimming, or anything. He reminded them of the imposing secret, and raised a ray of cheer. While it lasted, he got them interested in a new device. This was to knock off being pirates for a while, and be Indians for a change. They were attracted by this idea, so it was not long before they were stripped and striped from head to heel with black mud, like so many zebras, all of them chiefs, of course, and then they went tearing through the woods to attack an English settlement. By and by they separated into three hostile tribes, and darted upon each other from ambush with dreadful war-hoops, and killed and scalped each other by thousands. It was a gory day. Consequently, it was an extremely satisfactory one. They assembled in camp toward supper-time, hungry and happy. But now a difficulty arose. Hostile Indians could not break the bread of hospitality together without first making peace, and this was a simple impossibility without smoking a pipe of peace. There was no other process that ever they had heard of. Two of the savages almost wished they had remained pirates. However, there was no other way. So, with such show of cheerfulness as they could muster, they called for the pipe, and took their whiff as it passed, in due form. And behold, they were glad they had gone into savagery, for they had gained something. They found that they could now smoke a little without having to go and hunt for a lost knife. They did not get sick enough to be seriously uncomfortable. They were not likely to fool away this high promise for lack of effort. No, they practiced cautiously after supper with right fair success, and so they spent a jubilant evening. They were prouder and happier in their new acquirement than they would have been in the scalping and skinning of the six nations. We will leave them to smoke and chatter and brag, since we have no further use for them at present. End of chapter 16 Chapter Seventeen of the Adventures of Tom Sawyer by Mark Twain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Seventeen: Memories of the Lost Heroes. The point in Tom's secret. But there was no hilarity in the little town that same tranquil Saturday afternoon. The Harpers and Aunt Polly's family were being put into mourning with great grief and many tears. An unusual quiet possessed the village, although it is ordinarily quiet enough in all conscience. The villagers conducted their concerns with an absent air and talked little, but they sighed often. The Saturday holiday seemed a burden to the children. They had no heart in their sports, and gradually gave them up. In the afternoon, Becky Thatcher found herself moping about the deserted schoolhouse yard, and feeling very melancholy. But she found nothing there to comfort her. She soliloquized, Oh, if only I had a brass and iron knob again! But I haven't got anything now to remember him by. And she choked back a little sob. Presently she stopped, and said to herself, It was right here. Oh, if it was to do over again, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say it for the whole world. But he's gone now. I'll never, never, never see him any more. This thought broke her down, and she wandered away, with tears rolling down her cheeks. Then quite a group of boys and girls, playmates of Tom's and Joe's, came by 
and stood looking over the paling fence and talking in reverent tones of how tom did so and so the last time they saw him and how joe said this or that small trifle pregnant with awful prophecy as they could easily see now and each speaker pointed out the exact spot where the lost lad stood at the time and then added something like and i was a standing just so just as i am now and if you was him i was close to that and he smiled just this way and then something seemed to go all over me like awful you know and i never thought what it meant of course but i can see now then there was a dispute about who saw the dead boys last in life and many claimed that dismal distinction and offered evidences more or less tampered with by the witness and when it was ultimately decided who did see the departed last and exchanged the last words with them the lucky parties took upon themselves a sort of sacred importance and were gaped at and envied by all the rest one poor chap who had no other grandeur to offer said with tolerably manifest pride in the remembrance well tom sawyer he licked me once but that bid for glory was a failure most of the boys could say that and so that cheapened the distinction too much the group loitered away still recalling memories of the lost heroes in awed voices when the sunday school hour was finished the next morning the bell began to toll instead of ringing in the usual way it was a very still sabbath and the mournful sound seemed in keeping with the musing hush that lay upon nature the villagers began to gather loitering a moment in the vestibule to converse in whispers about the sad event but there was no whispering in the house only the funereal rustling of dresses as the women gathered to their seats disturbed the silence there none could remember when the little church had been so full before there was finally a waiting pause and expected dumbness and then aunt polly entered followed by sid and mary and they by the harper family all in deep black and the whole congregation the old minister as well rose reverently and stood until the mourners were seated in the front pew there was another communing silence broken at intervals by muffled sobs and then the minister spread his hands abroad and prayed a moving hymn was sung and the text followed i am the resurrection and the life as the service proceeded the clergyman drew such pictures of the graces the winning ways and the rare promise of the lost lads that every soul there thinking he recognized these pictures felt a pang in remembering that he had persistently blinded himself to them always before and had as persistently seen only faults and flaws in the poor boys the minister related many a touching incident in the lives of the departed too which illustrated their sweet generous natures and the people could easily see now how noble and beautiful those episodes were and remembered with grief that at the time they occurred they had seemed rank rascalities well deserving of the cowhide the congregation became more and more moved as the pathetic tale went on till at last the whole company broke down and joined the weeping mourners in a chorus of anguished sobs the preacher himself giving way to his feelings and crying in the pulpit there was a rustle in the gallery which nobody noticed a moment later the church door creaked the minister raised his streaming eyes above his handkerchief and stood transfixed first one then another pair of eyes followed the ministers and then almost with one impulse the congregation rose and stared while the three dead boys came marching up the aisle tom in the lead joe next and huck a ruin of drooping rags sneaking sheepishly in the rear they had been hid in the unused gallery listening to their own funeral sermon aunt polly mary and the harpers threw themselves upon their restored ones smothered them with kisses 
and poured out thanksgivings, while poor Huck stood abashed and uncomfortable, not knowing exactly what to do or where to hide from so many unwelcoming eyes. He wavered and started to slink away, but Tom seized him and said, Aunt Polly, it ain't fair. Somebody's got to be glad to see Huck. And so they shall. I'm glad to see him, poor motherless thing. And the loving attentions Aunt Polly lavished upon him were the one thing capable of making him more uncomfortable than he was before. Suddenly the minister shouted at the top of his voice, Praise God from whom all blessings flow! Sing and put your hearts in it! And they did. Old Hundred swelled up with a triumphant burst, and while it shook the rafters, Tom Sawyer the pirate looked around upon the envying juveniles about him and confessed in his heart that this was the proudest moment of his life. As the sold congregation trooped out, they said they would almost be willing to be made ridiculous again to hear Old Hundred sung like that once more. Tom got more cuffs and kisses that day, according to Aunt Polly's varying moods, than he had earned before in a year, and he hardly knew which expressed the most gratefulness to God and affection for himself. End of chapter 17